Hey, what's going on? Welcome to episode 16 of uh, Red River Podcast. Yes. Hanging out today as usual. Actually, not like last time. We, we missed Parker last time, so. Yeah. I was fucking too fucking past my bedtime, man. Guy's too regimented, you know? Long night at Costco. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn. Whoop that ass. I wouldn't even <laughs> fucking want to Costco that night, you know? We wanted to know when the uh, food server from, no, the, what was it, the... <laughs> <laughs> the, the the food oh the snack lady yeah, like the snack lady from the Kyle. Oh, she's gonna, get on, she's gonna yeah. be the, the next they're fucking guest. grumpy those people <laughs> we're gonna You're get supposed her to only take one and keep moving yeah that's why you she's so, hang out there well, you know what cool. it is they get pissed because they make more money if you actually buy the product but nobody ever fucking buys the shit they just stand there and fucking eat it I just picture uh-huh. like Al Bundy with, like when they set up shop. Oh, that was a great you know, episode. Like just hanging out because, like, I get what the, it was hot, right? Yeah, and, and that was air conditioning. Yeah, <laughs> that was a great episode. Uh, I could, like, to this day, I was just watching it recently, Married with Children, and welcome Scott from uh, Trip Face over yes. there. What's going on? How's it going? I wasn't allowed to watch Married with Children as a child. Oh, really? So, really? yeah, but I snuck in it. Great I snuck show. it anyway. Wow. So, yeah. why? You know, it's really weird. My mom let me do anything, like, watch anything read anything, watch any movie, no video games, and no Married with Children. Wow. Wow. Of all yeah, real, I've heard real, of the video weird. game thing. So the video I game thing that. I thought was good. Yeah. Um, the Married with Children thing, I don't think my dad was down with it either, so we kind of like snuck it in. But So I watched it, but she would like freak out if she caught us. It was racing it. for the day. It was definitely like he, yeah. like he was like the the antithesis of like Bill Cosby and yeah. the Cosby family. Ironically, now obviously, <laughs> um, we'll look at that a little different. Or yeah. like um, you know the, the Leave It to Beavers and all that other shit. He was just kind of like, you know, he was like the yeah. old, like like a uh, like the bad guy way that you root for. You're like, oh, this guy's a shitty dead, but he's awesome. Well, you know? he kind of, you know, it broke that mold of, you know, that picture perfect sitcom shit. I mean, some other shows have before, but this guy had this shitty job. Yeah. He came home, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he yeah, was bitter. And his wife a lot wanted of people to fuck him. him. He, nah. uh, his wife wanted to fuck him, and he was just like, nah. He's fucking tired. Yeah, man. it's just like, yeah, you know, I'm not I'm sure not a lot it. of guys were like, yeah, you know. You know, that's me, Al Bundy. It, yeah, minus the um, shoes. Shout out to to Anthrax for being on there. You remember that episode? Oh yeah, when they wrecked the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I I just rewatched like a couple of episodes, and like I don't think my girlfriend, who's eight years younger, really gives a shit about the show. Right. So I'm like sitting there, like laughing. she doesn't seem to give a shit about a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, that you <laughs> like to watch, including this show. <laughs> oh yeah, she has no idea. Um, but I'm like watching it, and I'm like laughing out loud, like I'm just like. Yeah. A mentally ill person. <laughs> one of my uh, one of my all time favorite episodes, which is a nice tie because Scott being in the the library industry was when he remember when he had the, uh, the library industry. Yeah. <laughs> wow, I, I like that. Uh, I'm gonna yeah. use that from now on. Make it, you know, make it sound professional. The library racket. When he had that, he had that book that was like five years, no, like fifty years. Like he had it out, and he kept getting the late fees uh, sent yes. to his house or whatever. Yeah. And then uh, he brings the thing back to the library, and they actually show like the slow mo shot, and it goes like under the librarian's like armpit and sticks the uh, <laughs> sticks the book back. That's one of my favorite episodes. I, right I now need to find. Yeah, that, that that's episode. a good episode. Yeah. Four touchdowns in one game. Oh man, poke yeah, high, poke high. <laughs> All the guy ever wanted was a toilet in the garage, right? Wasn't that his like the thing a that he wanted? Special brand the toilet. Too, Is that what it was? It? I don't remember. I think that flush really good. Uh, and then No Ma'am, he started the No Ma'am Club. Yeah. yeah. You know, good times. Yeah. Really, really good show. You yeah. Know. In case anyone out there listening has never seen Married with Children, you know. Do yourself a favor. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> totally. It's at, probably at the library. There you go. Yep. Very right. accessible Boom. stuff. Uh, yeah, today we have uh, Scott uh, Jazambek. It's Jarzambek. It's Great. good. You were close. Oh, you were close. Yeah. It's all right. It's in the wheelhouse. Definitely, yeah. So. <laughs> Um, today, and he came from, I guess you were visiting family, right? Yeah, my uh, mom still lives out on the East End, so... Uh, just a random visit? Yeah, just coming down to see my mom. She's got, she still lives out in the farm fields, so it's kind of nice. I've got two savage five- and seven-year-old boys, so whenever I go visit mom, it's like, just go. Just, yeah. just go and destroy things, and <laughs> they're very happy with that, so it works out pretty well. And uh, when did you move to, what, Albany, right? Oh, man. Uh, I moved to Albany in 99 for grad school and lived there for about nine years um, and then moved a little bit further downstate, like the Poughkeepsie area, for about five years and then moved back. I'm actually, I fell in love, as odd as that sounds, I fell in love with Albany, I think, in 90, I want to say 94. My friend Mike went to Hudson Valley up there and 
we drove up there to visit him because he was lonely and we saw sick of it all at winners um big shout out to winners uh which has now been burned down to the ground but saw winners with great snap case yeah uh-huh. um <laughs> Um, and, uh, we hung out like in the city and caught tags and skateboarded around and hung outside a goth night at the QE2, which was like kind of a well-known club back then and, uh, kind of fell in love with the place then. And then when Trip Face was traveling the play shows, we played up there a bunch of times with Indecision and made friends up there. And was it the Tom era or already Philly It was era? the Tom. It was definitely the Tom era. And, um, just kind of like really liked the city still do. And I had been living in Hartford I finished my undergraduate in Hartford, um, didn't know what I was going to do with my life, was working in a library, and the director of that library was like, why don't you go to library school? My reaction was kind of like, what, you need to go to school to be a librarian? Um, <laughs> and Albany had a program, and I had friends there, and it just made sense. And I kind of figured out pretty much after six months of living there, I was like, I'm probably going to live here the rest of my life. Yeah, awesome. yeah. like my friend who is one of my favorite drummers, he was actually... Um, a whole bunch of bands, a band called Lord Humongous and a whole bunch of bands from like that center each area that would play like the Roadhouse and all that other stuff. His wife went to library school and like when she was doing that, I was like, what the fuck is yeah, library yeah, school? It makes no sense. <laughs> what is this library industries? You yes, yes. About? <laughs> library industries. So what, like what do they teach you there? Not much. Uh, and I, I'll probably get in trouble for saying that, but uh, <laughs> no one's listening. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, so, you know, library school kind of teaches you. I don't, you know, cataloging how to like put the Dewey Decimal numbers on, like literally, like Dewey they're still Decimal? doing that. Is it like yeah. UHF? Uh, Conan the Librarian. Yes, Conan the Librarian. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So, like, how long is the course then? Like, it's it was supposed to be. It's usually a year and a half, but you do a lot of the serious parts of it is you learn how to kind of do research for people. A lot of it's, the industry now is super about technology, and that's why I went into it. So you learn how to teach people computers. Um, it's really hard to explain and yeah. wanna, you know put on the spot. Uh, I love my job. I absolutely love what I do. It's pretty much the, the basis of my job is helping people, mm-hmm. um, whether it's helping a kid find his first book that he or first book she falls in love with. I mean, I was in youth services um, or doing story times, which helps teach early literacy skills to parents or teaching a computer class. There's a bunch of people who I know myself and some of my friends where we taught them in computer class and they went on and they went on to computer jobs. I mean, and went on to really change their life. So you kind of get all this. It's a really, if you want to help people, it's a really, really great job. If you kind of have that intrinsic need to be a helpful person. Yeah. And so it really, I got my first, I worked with Albany Public Library for nine years, and I got my first job with them before I was finished with my degree, and kind of, luckily I did that because I kind of fell in love with the profession. I worked at a library um, in the south end of Albany, pretty socioeconomic disadvantaged neighborhood, and it was really cool all the different things I could do there. I could teach a computer class. I was helping people find you know, their cousin who was in jail and using the DOC site to kind of go through and reconnect people. And then after school, kids would come pouring in and it was kind of like a cool, almost like community center. Yeah, kind of like an alternative to like whatever else, like, you know, like me, especially like me growing up, like if I had something like that, Maybe I wouldn't have gotten in. Yeah, <laughs> all the yeah awful trouble. You know, somebody like smacked me in the head, and you know. Yeah, um, and we did, and we knew we knew we kind of saying that you smack kids in the no, head. No, never. <laughs> not my own, maybe, but um, <laughs> you know, I always you know I always kind of joke, but I'm I'm serious when I say that. See it? It's we're we're the we're the service, we're the recreation center for the freaks and geeks. And there's freaks I've learned in my career. I've worked in Albany now, um, worked in the Hartford School District for a while before I got into libraries. Hartford's rough. Hartford's rough. Yeah. Um, Poughkeepsie. I've worked in an, uh, an urban, uh, a, like a rural library, which we all know now our rural communities are in the same, you have the same disadvantages as kind of our inner cities. Yeah. Um, and it really is. I mean, it's really a weird social safety net that catches people that I think otherwise would fall through. I mean, Brian's a good example. Um, catches other people who might fall through the cracks and the weirdos who want horror movies. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't, you, there's no other kind of municipal, social, civic institution out there that would welcome people like me and Brian or you guys. Yeah. Um, I got into libraries because my library did a comic book club, the River, shout out to Riverhead Free Library. Um, they did a comic book club when I was like in fourth grade, which is like super early. And I was a total comic nerd. 
And I had already had been going to the library because my mom was very into education and academics. Um, and it was like perfect. And that like sucked me into libraries because I was like, they're doing a comic book club. Like this is 87, 86, like super early. So that got me really into, uh, really into libraries. And for us, there's not, there wasn't really much in Riverhead back then. So you'd go skating at the county center because there was no skate yeah, park. Of course. Definitely. And then if it was raining or you were bored or it was getting dark out, you'd walk over to the public library and it was like the one place we could hang out where the hicks and the jocks weren't trying to beat us up. Yeah. Right. So that was kind of our landing spot whenever yeah, they weren't we were. going to the library. No, they <laughs> weren't. I mean, some of them so. were. <laughs> I remember in Selden, like just being like, hmm, there is a, a skate park over in Riverhead, but we didn't drive yet. And we're like, one day we'll make it there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was, from an early age, that was like my spot when I wasn't and, going to shows. And the comic books, right? So, like, what do you think, like, the, the time that we're living now that I feel like every comic book on the planet is being made into a shitty movie? Or real life. Have you ever read Bendis DMZ? No. Oh, got it. That's that's a big suggestion. He's a little bit of a sketchball, but um, great comic book that came out about four or five years ago, and it's actually about a civil war in the United States. Okay. And it is very reflective of the time we live in. But to be honest, comic books as a format or a media has always kind of predicted the future. I mean, you really always see that Alan Moore stuff, and I'm a huge Alan Moore fan. Um, Alan Moore predicted so many things that we've experienced in the last 20 years, politically, socially. Um, and that's comic books and punk rock in the 80s were like hand in hand. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you've read comics, you probably listen to punk rock. And if you got into punk rock... Next thing you know, you were going to a comic book store and hanging out with all the there nerds. There were certain like gateway things. Like, yeah. like what we did was we were, you know, we would skate, and then our friends would BMX. And yep. certain things, like you said, it was just like oh, it was just a matter of time before you got like a Cypress Hill record or you got a Minor Threat discography, yeah. and you're like, you know, those things are just like hand in hand right Playing there. Your position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. basically, like know. you know, there, there's something <laughs> that goes with that. But um, I see like all these like comic book movies being made, and it's like I, I even like 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 let's say Preacher. I've never read Preacher. No, the comic book's so much better. And I, you know, I'm I'm sounding like the typical librarian who's going to be like, and I'll probably surprise you with one thing on my list. Did you tell him I um, don't read? <laughs> so, Sam only so, reads when he's doing bids. Yeah. That's his line. That is true. <laughs> you know, the the I was really excited for the show, and they've been talking about that show for years. Yes. So when it finally came on, and uh, I watched like three episodes, and I was like, <sighs> God damn it! I it's kind of like the Watchmen movie, uh -huh. where if you wait too long to make a movie based on the arc of the comic you're going to just totally get it wrong. It's not going to fit in that time and place. Now, is it, like, for someone like me, you know, because I, I don't read the uh, the Walking Dead stuff or Preacher, and the first season of Preacher was okay. Um, the last episode we did, we were talking about our favorite things of 2017 so far, and the first four episodes of season two of Preacher are fucking mind-blowing with the saint killer or whatever the fuck holy shit they may guy's... have i haven't do you watched think it, if you have... didn't read it yeah you'd have a different perception because that's where i'm at the i don't know because yeah. that happens i mean being a librarian i read a lot right and so you know it's not just comic books it's there's a ton of movies that are being made especially from like you know i was my focus for a really long time was ya young adults and children so all these young adult novels that i would read because i'd try to get them in kids' hands and talk up the book, they're now all, they've all been made into movies. And I've noticed that I tend to like the m movies more if I didn't read the book mm. Yeah, because that, that's where I'm at, I think. Um, because, you know, there, I have a friend who gave me the, the one, one of the uh, preacher books, and I'm like, listen, I, I know myself, I'm just not, like, I read 20 pages and I, I, I just don't have the mind <coughs> for it. Um, so... When I watched the show, I, I just watched it as like a show that was just made up and stuff like that. So I don't have that attachment. But the flip side of that is like, let's say, you know, Halloween, the original movie, like Rob Zombie comes in and does like this bastardized version. And to me, it's like the most offensive thing ever because I'm like, absolutely, that's not the way it goes. Like, I don't want to hear a backstory on Michael Myers. I don't give a shit. I don't want to see his mom as a fucking stripper. So to like, I just can't get over it because it, it just bastardizes something that I grew up loving and it has no connection to it. Whether you get you get attached to a character, yeah, like they're your friend. I mean, especially if you're like a nerd. <laughs> I mean, I'm sitting reading. You're you in know, the right place. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, you know, I, <laughs> I, look uh, around. The Watchmen. My mom again. My mom wouldn't let me watch Married with Children. She let me read The Watchmen 
like before it was in graphic novel format. Let's just shout your mom out because whatever she did worked. Yeah. I hope. I hope. I yeah. should. That's it. Yeah, I, I, I think so. If my kids turn out all right, then she did. She did a good job. You know what I find though too, like. Uh, I know somebody like, you know, Game of Thrones, your favorite show. Oh, um, I love Game like of Thrones. Like they read the so book <laughs> and the books, people rave about the books. I have not read the books. Um, so I have a different view on it than they do. Now, Walking Dead, I read the graphic comics, which obviously the show. Now, I hate, I don't like the show anymore. Yeah. But when it first started, it, it, it veered way differently than the book did. And she asked me, like, doesn't that piss you off? And I'm like, well, I've kind of look at it this way now. I know how the book progressed. Now it's like almost like what if. What if this didn't happen? I already know the story in the book, so let me see the different take on it in the film as a different piece. You know a what parallel I mean? universe kind yeah, of like idea. That's the positive spin I have on it. Eventually that show just sucked like crazy, but you're hanging in there, right? <laughs> I just, uh, for me, uh, there's something about uh, that era, that backdrop. I can't really fuck with like once I see a dragon and a horse, I'm out. <laughs> I used to make the I used to make the joke I could never do longsword. I could always do yeah because I love kung fu flicks. Oh yeah, I, oh yeah. And I always would joke I cannot do the longsword. I can only do a short sword. That show I love. <laughs> like and it's weird because I'm the same way. I'm like f- fuck dragons. Like no interest yeah. and like kind of like I'm not into like gratu- I'm kind of a prude I'm not into gratuitous sex and like the first season I'm like I don't know if I can fucking hang with this yeah. and then like after like four or five episodes when, like, I'm like the first ten minutes is a brother and sister fucking yeah and it's like yeah I'm not this is not cool <laughs> this is not not cool so yeah. but it's like a porn hub uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that show now I got sucked into like yeah. I power well watched. there's so much other stuff with like the politics of it yeah. that, that you know People love that show. Um, you know, my, my girlfriend uh, went to my bass player's house and his wife and stuff. We all hung out there. I just ate food while they watched because it was like the premiere night and they were all hanging out. And I just stared at my phone and ate like <laughs> <laughs> chips because obviously she needed a ride there. You know, that sounds she okay actually too. bought Game of Thrones beer. I was about ah. to say if they had like food that was like yeah. named after them. Yeah, no, they wow. she they had Game of Thrones beer, so they just sat there. So she needed a DH, you know. That nice. Was nice. You should have saved me one. I could have put it next to the Iron Maiden six pack that I'll never open. I honest speaking of Iron Maiden. <laughs> oh <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Oh no, I don't care. Um, like I said, anyone else? Like the fact that you're like you know I, what I'm talking about is is uh, I think I got offered six Iron Maiden tickets in the I've last forty eight hours. I've never seen some shit like that in my life. Everyone just kept popping up screenshots like someone offered tickets. I'm like, no, but where the fuck do I have friends like this? And if it was like anyone else, like you live in Albany, you know, people really do want to hear from you. Like the people that we talk to. There's like 20 people. That's okay. Thank you. A lot of people, people, man. I'm going to say. You get a lot of mentions on this show. Uh, Put 20 people in a room. That's a lot of people. Uh, (laughs) Seriously, man. So um, I couldn't in like good conscience um, reschedule it. So I was like, fuck it. You know, it's just, I've seen Maiden before, and I just, you know, like, They're Bruce just going to play the new record, I'm telling you. Watch his plane so crash tonight. Out. And I'd be like, <laughs> never again. God forbid. All right. <laughs> I dare you. I love Buckle Souls. <laughs> I thought Buckle The last record's great, so. I, t- I took my, uh, my wife's, I guess, nephew to his first show. It was Bullet for My Valentine opening for Iron Maiden. And it. I was like, yo, you are, this is going to blow. He was just getting his feet wet into metal and shit. Yeah. I don't know how old he was, 14 or whatever. I'm like, you were going to remember this fucking night for the rest of your life. Like, amping the shit up, run to the hill, all the shit. <laughs> and it was one of those shows where, like, <laughs> oh, we're not playing. It was, we uh, were at the sa- it was Matter life, of Life and, and life Death. Because we were at the same show. I mean, my friend are looking at They play one song from the new record, and you get that. They open up with it. And then another one. Like, I played all yeah, What the fuck is going on here? And someone next to me was like, oh, you didn't hear? I'm like, clearly we're the only ones that didn't. Like, yeah, they're just playing. Now, somewhere somewhere, album. somewhere in, in another seat, me and my friend Dave were like, <laughs> I don't know, that's eight songs off the new record. Yeah. I think they're going to play the- <laughs> I tell, like, the... I mean, they brought Eddie out, and the kid was like, whatever. I'm like, God, Bullet for My Valentine was better. Yeah. <laughs> but, I felt but, like. Uh, not really. but uh, And someone had a sign that said, play some old shit. And he like called for it. Did you see that? And he ripped it in half. I'm like, well, there we go. <laughs> nah, it's probably sleeping. That answers that question. <laughs> but uh, I felt like you, like we were watching, you know, like I said, one song in, two song in, three song in. And it was like that scene in uh, European Vacation where like Rusty's like, Dad, uh, I think he's going to pork her. 
<laughs> he's like not gonna pork and then we're just sitting there and he's like dead i really <laughs> think <it." laughs> and like d- like my friend's like i think they're playing the whole record i'm like yeah. mm, i don't think so yeah. five six seven i think they're playing they the whole came record. out and played the t- they played the theme iron maiden they played the evil that men do and one other tune i know uh, hallowed be that name i think yeah that yeah. was it like you motherfucker. that's always my fear when i go see bands i like yeah it's like ah I but hate I, that shit, especially like older bands. When I we're, get what they're doing, hard, though. I get, yeah, I get, I get what get they're it. doing. Yeah. I get it as a former sure. musician. I yes. get it. Sure. You but know why? Because you love your new songs. Yeah. You're yeah. like, oh, this is this the is best. better. Yeah. This like, is oh, better. You, you I've think my craft. You, yeah. You, you think Number of the Beast is good? Wait till you hear this record. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, but it's like, it's, you know, for me, you in the same boat, got kids, whatever. We get the big night out or whatever. It's the one night out of the year we go out. This is it. This is the show I'm going to. Like I saw, I, I saw Peter Murphy with Ted <laughs> recently in the city. Shout out to Ted. Shout out to Yo, Ted. Shout out to our Ted. record world friend. <laughs> and like you know, Peter Murphy. Yeah, us, you want to see like? Yo, he didn't even play "Cut You Up." You see, that would be the only reason I'd come out. <laughs> he played two Neil Young covers. Uh, he's, I'd walk. <laughs> he out. played "Heart of Gold." I'd walk out. I was like, I'd "What like, the uh, fuck? No you way. only had one hit. You yeah, didn't he... even play that shit." Psychedelic Furs <laughs> just played, and our neighbor like I was gonna go. It's like all set to go. Playing the singles, too. And, and I was just like, this was, and I was about to leave, and then I went, yeah, no, I don't want to leave my house. Um, so it was like, I didn't go. And yeah. she came back. She's like, they didn't play anything no. really? you'd want to hear. And I'm like, oh, but they're coming through again. Okay, yeah, and because I'm like, like, the tour, the one that I saw them, they were saying it, they were playing the hits. Yeah. yeah. They, Two they, years so. ago, I think they did a tour where they didn't play the hits, and I think they yeah, felt they, it. You gotta. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's you've some reached extent, point. I think I get it. Like, for a band like psych like people that have like a like you know if Katy Perry comes out and doesn't do the hits, I get it. But like Iron Maiden have so many records. Like I I don't mind here. Like some of the songs on, on Book of Souls, yes. are good. Like I'll hear two, th- throw two of them in, yes. in there, one here. But like spread it around. Just don't give little, me yeah. Don't give me a, a ten to one ratio. Yeah, I got one beat for that. My my wife and my in laws. We went to go see Hall and Oates. <laughs> nice. Jones Beach. Nice. Hall and Oates had some jams. Yeah, I got yeah, notes chain there. <clears throat> yeah, well, they didn't play any of them really. <sighs> they were prom- they were doing a blue their blues influences a box set or some shit. They these guys had eighteen number one fucking songs. Wow. And it was raining and shit. I think that's and I'm like, what wrong. the fuck? Are you serious? Sure, those right tickets now? weren't cheap either. No, uh, we left early. It was Billy bullshit, Billy bro. Corgan was doing the same thing. Billy Corgan from Smashing Pumpkins is one of those musicians who I adored. Like they were the best thing since like fucking like Fun Dip to me. Yeah. All right. Nice. <laughs> Shout out to Fun Dip. Well, they were uh, good. They were heavy. They had they had power. everything. They did it. Yeah, it was a great but he was songwriter. One of those people that social media hurt because he was so terrible on it he had the, the worst shittiest opinions he was like the quintessential like hey I get off my lawn kids and then he would like write 30 songs that no one knew and he refused like he would play like one old song because it was like uh this like battle of being like oh fuck you it's like this is what i'm doing now and it's yeah. fine that's what you want to do by all means do it it's just it's a bit of a middle finger to yeah. people that got you there. I think he you know? I think he uh I think he figured it out cuz this was like maybe 10 years ago. So now he, I think he'll do some of the older songs now. No matter how sick you are maybe of those old songs, those songs were really meaningful to a lot of older people that are going to your show that were like soundtracks to their life, like yeah. postcards and their memories and that's an honor that they mean so much. Like pepper the shit in. It's yeah. cool. And you're going to that show as like a consumer. You're going as like yeah. someone who's wanting to relive. I want to go see a band that I loved when I was 18 mm-hmm. and relive being 18. Yeah. Not feel 41 and going, I don't know these songs. My yeah. back hurts. <laughs> like, this beer is really expensive. Oh, I can't like, believe we just got the, general admission. We should have paid for those seats. The up there. babysitter's texting me because <laughs> Silas won't stop playing Minecraft. It's like a total headache. I just yeah. want to go home. I, I would rather like see a band and be like, I'm not going to look at my phone. I don't give a shit if the house is on fire. Yeah. I'm going to run up front and sing along and be 18 for an hour and then see my chiropractor the next day. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think most musicians get that. Um, and I worked in music for years after I kind of stopped doing the band thing. Most good bands get that and they know that that's the experience they're providing. But then you get people who are just, they're so stuck on their own ego. Yeah. They don't really give a shit. 
their performance is about, which is cool, and I don't really mind. Yeah, but yeah. No, you know, they they don't get the fact that people are paying a lot of money. Yeah. Babysitter, ticket, yeah. beer, gas to get to the show, tolls to get to the show. It's like frustration of yeah. driving in on a Wednesday in arguing, traffic. Yeah, yeah arguing go with your wife because she kind of doesn't want to go. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, all those things. What do you mean you, you don't, don't like screwdriver? <laughs> 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 the first record, of course. Yes, first record. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Edit that yeah. one out. Yeah, <laughs> we'll fix that. But uh, yeah, so going to you, Scott, um, and actually to to go back to that, you know, the ticket prices now, you know, since since I think I've said it before, like the records don't sell. You know, they're they're a piece of music. You know, like when. Um, I haven't heard a band. I'll just go to Spotify. I'll listen to it, and then it'll, like, I'll make a mental note. I'll be like, oh, you know what? When this band comes around and there's, like, three bands and they're one of the bands on there, I'm going to be like, oh, I'm probably going to go. But now you don't buy the album, but you're still going to pay because that's why ticket prices are, like, instead of $25 now, they're, like, $40, $50, Mm. and that's it because they're, like, you're still getting – they're still making money, but I, I think everyone's just used to a certain amount. Like, you know, like Chris Rock says, a custom. <laughs> Yo, man, what the fuck's a custom? Yeah. So um, you're still paying for it. You know, like you're still like uh, that extra 10 or $15 that you seem to, you know, pay for tickets. Like today, those maiden tickets, I think were like $150. Uh, yeah. Holy like shit. remember like 15 years bill. ago <laughs> remember 15 years ago like when like blaze bailey left right that's who they had on there <laughs> like yeah for one album right i think it was like one or two albums and like bruce came back i don't think they could have sold that mulcahy's yet, <laughs> <laughs> somehow they, yeah they flipped it around and you know what good for them but that's also a whole industry that you're paying for so i worked for a company called step up presents which was the big booking company up in albany um, for years doing bouncing door doing their website um, you know it's a whole and some of the guys I worked with that was their job mm-hmm. like that's what they did for a living so when you're paying that $50 you're not just paying for that band you're paying for the guys who are working the door working the barricade the bartenders right. the three or four stage hands because every band is now a full time touring band with a giant boss and need you know they can't carry their own equipment someone else has to carry that equipment in me I was like a cranky guy yelling at everybody where to put their equipment and to move faster and to get on stage and that their time was up um, you know you're paying for all that right. and I think most people don't realize that with, with the concert experience and then again there's no CD sales it's all merch sales and then that guarantee when they walk in the door so that's 20 bucks right there 30 bucks right there to pay the band mm-hmm. and that extra 20 30 dollars yeah. to pay all of that support staff and also on top of that you know you made a great white jer- joke earlier um but that completely changed the industry um when great white happened and then there was a young lady who was murdered in new york all security in this state in new york had to become certified mm-hmm. so we were paying we and once we all got certified somebody we're got like, murdered at a show uh, no murdered at a club in new york city and the big thing the big hoo-ha over that was he wasn't there's no certification of bouncers so when that happened the state really came down and all of a sudden we're paying a bunch of money to get literally like it looked like a license and once that happened i was like well you're not paying me eight bucks an hour you're gonna pay me twelve dollars an hour because you can't just get some the the pizza delivery guy to throw in a staff shirt and work a show anymore so you know and with great white it was the clubs had to change and they had to pay more money for insurance um and they had to really start following fire code which i don't think anybody before no. great white ever did and that really changed the industry just as much as not being able to do music sales through cds yeah that's uh-huh. like one yeah. of the saddest 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 pieces of history on the planet oh, yeah. like i can't even comprehend uh and it was like upstate right it was in rhode island rhode island yeah, i think it was in warwick rhode island yeah, yeah. like yes. just the fact like you know i'm not going to touch on it but it's just super sad like going to a show and then that's what happens yeah. and it wasn't kids it was people like us going to again we talked about reliving being 18 again yeah and that's why they did the stupid fireworks show because they wanted to make it like yeah when they played the coliseum um and you know that's sad to think about the families that were affected we're really we're going to depress the hell out of everybody with this podcast yeah <laughs> um, but you know this is not kids not that kids dying isn't horrible we know about the rave in San Francisco where it was an illegal rave and there was a fire. Um, but this was, you know, families being affected because there were married couples who were 
everyday Joe and Janes, and they were gone. They died in a horrible fire. Um, and so I think that kind of resonated a little bit more, at least with politicians and at least with, you know, regulations. Yeah. yeah I and- can't believe the club would let, let them do that shit, though. I worked at CPI for so long, which was like a tinderbox, and we yeah. had gray white. And, like, if they had brought that up, be like, what? Yeah. The fuck. I would have told them to fuck off. You ain't playing I mean, the Coliseum anymore. Look Sparklers, around you. Maybes, but Look that's at it. this no, dump no. you're in. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> this, you're lucky you got this. Put the fireworks away. Yeah. That's it. Uh, they... but... That load in, I would have been like, uh, no. Yeah, leave no. that one in the bus, yeah. buddy. Not tonight. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to light this. Save um, that for Rock, Oklahoma when it starts. <laughs> um, so going back to you, yeah. uh, what town did you grow up in? Grew up in Riverhead. Riverhead? Uh, actually, Calverton, Baiting Hollow area, out mm-hmm. in the middle of nowhere. What, what? Like literally farms. <laughs> um, I know Riverhead just because I did a couple of bids up there. Yeah, well, that's possible. Um, <laughs> no, it's definitely possible. Definitely possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, grew up like on a farm. My dad was a truck driver and Shout a race car driver. <laughs> I skated around that prison a bunch of times. Yeah. Um, you might have been with a few guys I graduated no, with. No, but I'll tell you a funny story about I remember Buddy being back. in jail. Um, for, it was just for like 30 days this one time. And uh, I guess I was still in high school. And so these, I guess they would bring kids in from high schools. That's scary. It's like yeah, a scary right? street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> so I'm sitting there in my cell, you know, like whatever I, you know, I guess in the middle of the day and these kids were brought in and I noticed that it was the, the high school I was in but the year before me and everyone's looking at me like what the fuck <laughs> and I'm like yeah man I don't know they're like what the and then you know the line's going and like all the prisoners next to me are yelling at them because that's what they're supposed to do right. and this one dude next to me is like I'm gonna open your ass like a bag of potato chips <laughs> and they just started going like all these kids are looking at me and I'm just like you didn't yell at hey. anybody and no. make him comb your chest to him? No. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. Give me your cocktail fruit. <laughs> <laughs> Rub this Kool-Aid powder on your lips. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was weird, too. <laughs> but that's the county. You deal. might have waved yeah. out the little window while Scott was. <laughs> might have. We skated around that show all the time. <laughs> yeah, it all was like time? 98, maybe? 97? 97, 98, so. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so you were skating up there? Memory lane. Yeah, you you know, sk- I started skating in Selden, too, man. Always. Yeah, and I rode. We were always waxing the curb. We <laughs> used to uh, we used to come up, when I rode BMX, we used to come up to Selden. There was a little track yeah. next to a bike shop up there that we yeah. used to ride at. Yeah, I mean, I, I we had, like, a little skate hardcore scene out of, like, between Riverhead and Mattatuck. Um, that was just, you know, we were all the nerdy kids, and... Basically, shout out to my sister um, in Record World because my sister was like the quintessential yeah. new waver. I mean, total nerd, key club. Is she older? She is older. Mm-hmm. And um, so she worked, she was like literally like with Gosi, to Peshmo, to Jones Beach every time. Um, so I like kind of grew up where music was a big deal in my house. And so my sister got me into like the Smiths and to Peshmo and New Order. <laughs> Um, and of course, being like the bratty little brother, I had to like be cooler than my sister. <laughs> so from there, I kind of started getting into punk, um, Dead Kennedys, uh, Husker Du. And from those bands, that's kind of was the bridge into hardcore and um, skateboarding, too. I got into skateboarding probably seventh grade. It's probably 88, 89. You saw all like the videos, man. I used yeah. to love those videos. Yeah. Like- and and taking the, the video, we'd watch the videos and then we'd hold up a tape recorder to the side of the TV and take all the songs, all the songs. off the t- off the video. Because that is so mm. many great songs. Yeah. Like you would be like, what the, who, what band is this? Because yeah. it was always like some like really amazing hip hop or like some like just awesome. Day, I, I got into De La Soul because of a skate yeah. video. I got into The Descendants because of a skate video and it was just put it on a cassette and then listen to it on my Walkman all the time. Yeah. No, I, I, I love like that's, I mean, I guess everything is just easy to get now, but like, man, like when you found like, you had, you, f- you, had you, oh, you had to work for it. You had to work for it. You, <laughs> yeah. you found that, and yeah. you're like, ah, oh, shit, this is my song Fuck right yeah. here, and you yeah. just play it. I remember I would do that, too, with the recorder to the TV. When I was younger, I heard, like, Purple Haze for the first time, and I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. This is amazing. I want to listen like, to this all the time. All the time, and, like, I couldn't comprehend how to record or, like, how where to even get something like that from. So I had this recorder, and I, I think I just had, like, the verse and chorus, but I loved it because it was just... I don't know. I loved it. You know, I guess that's why I just got into music. Spoke to you. Yeah. It just spoke, completely spoke to me. And I'm just like, 
Purple Haze, man. To this day, I can still listen to Jimi Hendrix. I think yeah, but he's, he's actually on my list. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's on my list. Okay, there good, is. good. So, yeah, so my sister worked at a record store, and my sister was cool. Um, and so I started. That was the job to have that. Yeah, that was. It was the record it store. It was the record yeah. store. If and I worked there later from on. From Riverhead to, you know, out east where I was, yeah. that's. That was the record got, store. I mean, there's Caldor and there's places, but if you wanted to buy music, that that's was where the you only place to fucking go. And there was that's a it. book that you could special order from. And I was like, like the nerdy book. special order kid. <laughs> and I lived two miles away and I'd ride my bike into town. Like, that's how we got the skateboard. So I'd have a backpack, some beat up, you know, like road bike we'd steal from, we stole from somebody. We ride in two miles into town, skate all day. And then I would come in to get a ride home from my sister sometimes. And I'd break open that giant book and I'd have a list. And that list came from, I'd buy a record, I'd look at the thank you list. And I'd write down bands that sounded right. cool from the thank you list. And then I'd go and I'd order their record. And sometimes it was really good. Sometimes, sometimes it was crap. It was, yeah, but yeah. it was, you know, that's, you'd wait. And Revelation Records and Ted would always make fun of me. Because yeah. Revelation Records was, I'd have to pay extra because <laughs> it was considered an import, even though the label was in Connecticut. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so I, but I'd pay for like a five song like a tape of a seven inch because yeah. i didn't i wasn't cool enough to have a record player so everything i bought was on cassette and i'd get a you know i'd pay like back then ten dollars yeah. for like a five song cassette but it was like that was a huge amount of money back then but it was like how were you saving money did you have like a job? I landscape man I, landscape? when you when you if you grew up in riverhead you worked on a farm or you landscaped from the age of eight this is Long Island. Yeah, right? this is Long Island. Like it's a Amish. potato farm. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I was driving. I was driving to pick up at like seven or eight, man. And, and to was, me, Riverhead was like a metropolis. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> From where I'm from. And Riverhead, yeah, it was. So yeah, <laughs> I, in Riverhead, the, the today. big city. We're hitting Caldor, maybe Woolworth if we got time. <laughs> yeah, Caldor, Caldor was the shit. Hit up Denny's. I bought my my first psychedelic first cassette at Caldor. Um, yeah, so uh, and used to hang out in the Caldor weird sculpture in the front, like inside of it. <laughs> I tell people all the time, like they have cool older siblings. Like you had one, Parker had one. Yeah, I it's didn't the key. Have any? Yeah, cool like I, my siblings. parents listened to shit music, and I was the oldest one, so I was like, like totally just finding shit on my own. My older siblings listen to horrible music. Yeah, I was on my <laughs> so, own. You know, but, like my, my but mom, it worked out. Yeah, yeah. They and like so, I'm always like jealous or like envious of people that had that introduction like that's great like the smith like everything yeah. that your sister listened to and it was the whole crew from record world that kind of you know back then it was so hard to find people like you that everybody was different ages you know yeah. everybody hung out like dudes who were five years apart would hang out with each other because there was no one else to talk there was no finding somebody on facebook and becoming friends with them it was you hung out with whoever sorry you hung out with whoever was into whatever in your town so, you know, I'd go hang out with Brian and Ted, and those guys were, like, godly to me because they were the kind of old. Now we're, like, the same age, but back yeah, then yeah. we were you were way older. Yeah, and so it would be like. <laughs> I get that every yeah. episode. <laughs> so, you know, you walk in the door and be like, you know, is this cool? Like, should I listen to this? Have you heard this? Well, records, like Chester record and world, Spike. You, you, know, you know, it's a chain, like a coconut or whatever, but. Out there, Record World would be like an indie mom and pop yeah. shop because there was nothing else, and everyone hung out there. Yeah, yeah, for and hours. They, yeah, for hours. And that that book that he's talking about, it was like five phone books yeah. of fucking stuff, and you could just just go, go through, through it, it all did, day, man. Did you ever make it to the the mecca? Like when we like when I would make it to St. Mark's in Manhattan. Oh yeah, I'd oh, be yeah. like, oh, yeah. like I would just like always come home with like a bag i'm like i gotta stop a yellow rat bastard i need some shirts yeah. i need my vice magazine it was overwhelming i almost had to plan the trip out yeah like all yeah. right generation first and yeah that was yeah. always my first stop but there like, was also record town in smithtown mall and i bought a lot of my yes. records where it's over i don't know if that food that food court existed five years ago i can remember it because it was like my mom's like oh we gotta go to the mall and i'm like i get to go to record town you know, like yeah. and i have my list and uh I think I bought my first Husker Du record there. I think I bought what I record? Mi- um, Warehouse, which I still defend and say is a great record. Um, okay. Uh, I bought. I'm pretty sure I brought bought Chromags there. I don't know if I bought Chromags Age of Quarrel at Record World. I was trying to remember that today. But uh, Dead Kennedys, um, uh, Disasters and Plastic Surgery, bought at Record Town. I think it's Record Town, yeah. but it was right by the. Right. Right by the food court in Smith. Um, That's when that mall was cool. They yeah. had Hot Top. Yeah, they had a Hot Top before anybody else. In the mall. I think I got go my first pair of Doc Martens at that. There. 
yeah, yeah. so it was you know he, he traveled he put in work yeah, yeah. You know, and it was that's that's all you had to spend money on so i'd yeah. go and like make a bunch of money working land at a landscaping yard and i had all this cash burning a hole in my pocket and if i wasn't buying comic books or a new deck for my skateboard it was yeah because your overhead back then was low well yeah there's no <laughs> like, yeah it's not like i was riding my bike yeah it was like paying for my beeper and that was about it yeah. nice. and, uh, <laughs> one know. four three six nine yeah <laughs> um, and so you know i just bought a ton of records how did you start playing music honestly because so in riverhead the first hardcore band out of riverhead was grid who still, if you can find that demo, it might be on YouTube. Listen to it. Awesome. I, awesome. Grid. Awesome guys. G R I D. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Way ahead of their you time. You heard it? Oh yeah. Um, they did a they did a live split with us. Um, just these dudes were like super ahead of their time, and also like my best friends. Like one of them was my best friend growing up. Um, and I just hung out with them. I skated with Brian. I never really wanted to get into music, like playing it. I really liked photography. I thought I was going to be like the next Spike Jones when Spike Jones was just with a Spike skate. Jones, yeah, yeah, Spike Jones. Um, and I loved skateboarding, and and that was enough. And then listening to music when I wasn't skating or wasn't you what know. What is Spike Jones doing now, by the way? He's balling. Is he? Yeah, he does like he does movies and yeah. and music videos. What the fuck was the last movie he made? Oh, he's made a lot of good ones, man. Yeah. You know. We gotta Google it. John yeah. Malk being John Malkovich, oh, really? he did. Uh, what was the one with Nicolas Cage? The last good movie Con Nicolas Air? Cage ever did. Was it Weatherman? Did he do Weatherman? Face Off. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, I think it was named after a flower. What the fuck was the name of it? Magnolia. No. Shit, it'll come to me. But uh, I mean, the guy's been in a hundred movies last month. He he he's made a lot of films. He's he he did. He's he did like um, ten movies today. He did. Uh, the way the wild things are. Yeah, that oh, was yeah. his last. A lot of shit. Yeah, yeah. Like just did that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but back then he was just a really good skateboarding yeah. photographer, and that was who I idolized. So, Grid was playing a bunch, and they were kind of like, we started talking because we're like, we need another band from our town. So Walter, the bass player, sold me one of his crappy old basses. And Rick, the guitar player, showed me how to play like two Jane's Addiction songs. What do you remember? What they were? Oh God, no. be mountain song. Mountain song, definitely. Yeah, and then dan, 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 yeah, and I still that's my warm up song. <laughs> yeah. um, and Yo, then maybe three days. Oh, maybe wow. might have been three that's days. Ambitious. I still there's something about warm up songs because whatever I learned when I was reading Guitar World magazines, like the tableture, yeah. that's your warm up song, man. I'll still play <laughs> Monkey Business by Skid Row, like when I'm at practice on the. Dan and it. Like, that's how I check my tuning. I'll play yeah. funky business. Uh, I would drive everybody has nuts in a band. Yeah. The first time I pick up a guitar, if I'm just fucking around, it, it, it's the intro solo to Fade to Black. Yeah. Just the slow part. I ain't yeah. fucking with the rest of it now. <laughs> <laughs> but, nice. But that's, yeah, that's, I mean, definitely mountain song stuff. So. Yeah. But so, yes. so, yeah, so I had a, you know, I got a bass. Um, my friend Austin had just moved out to Riverhead from Queens and he was super, like he fit in, he meshed with our group of friends right away. He wrote graffiti. Um, I think he lived in the same apartment building as the band Demise. So he knew hardcore, he knew good hardcore. So him and I started jamming with my friend Mike and it was just basically to fool around and kind of be a band that played in the basements with Grid. And then... I think I was working at Record World at the time. Yeah, we worked together at yeah. Record World. And, um, was it Record World or Square Circle? It might have been then? Square Circle by then. Yeah. So I was like the quintessential... If, if Record World was a movie, I was this quintessential kid who just skateboarded and kind of like showed up just in time to get on a shift. Yeah. And then his friends were annoying and would come in and like rob the store. Yeah. I was that kid in that movie. <laughs> yeah, you um, were with me that night we got robbed. <laughs> oh, yeah. We got robbed a bunch of times. Was, it's Riverhead. Do you remember this? Like, I think it was you and me were working. I believe, or maybe me, no, me and Ted were working. Like gunpoint robbed? No. no. And you came in with Craig, and you brought in Nine Inch Nails' Pretty Hate Machine. Great we record. We were playing it over the system, and these this old, like, homeless-looking yeah! black dude came in. Yeah, and just. And this other guy came in, and the, the old homeless guy, he was dancing the head like a hole, and we thought it was the funniest shit in the world, and we're like, put on that song, put on that song. And his boy was over. And just robbing the cassette, his blind. The whole reggae section, like. Gone. Gone. Even the fucking Gone. the long ass plastic. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know yeah. how the fuck he got that shit. It was out. and we were just so it's a great record. So <laughs> Honestly, I can understand we it. got caught in the moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, shout out to the. I mean, if you're gonna one two someone, that's how to do yeah. it. Yo, they got us, man. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know how we explained that shit the next day, but no. We, Anybody seen the reggae section? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, uh, we might need to order Something some stuff in the reggae section. <laughs> 
but uh so you, yeah now that's that's where we met in yeah, record world yeah so yeah. one day ryan's just like hey i kind of started a band and we need a singer and i was like you know ryan to me was like the guy i talked to about metal and industrial so when he was like yeah we we, we covered gi joe head stomp i was yeah. like oh okay cool um and i knew jeff the drummer because he had played in a metallica cover band did he um, really? Yeah. Back then, too? Back then, yeah. Dude, that, he always ripped on the drums. Like, yeah. I, he came out of the womb and just we was a natural drummer. We gotta get him on. Gotta I know he's in California still, yeah. man. Or Portland Jeff, Jeff now. Fab. He's elusive. He will be getting here. He promises. But, he's uh, avoiding us. Yeah. He's <laughs> a, <laughs> Let me know when he's down because I'd like to hang pocket. out with him. I think he's yeah, going to say absolutely. Maiden tonight, actually. Maybe. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would have sent my tickets. He's got tickets. He wants them. No, he just sent me something from fucking Oregon and everything. But yeah, yeah, we were jamming in his basement in Mattituck and uh, just having fun playing hardcore and stuff. And I, I was getting my feet wet with that, playing with that. And uh, and I knew Scott knew his shit, man. And you, yeah, you were always a smart guy. I figured lyrically, like it just made yeah, a we, lot of sense. We wrote Brother. You you guys had already written Brotherhood, mm. and we went to your parents' house because you had to like get your gear. Because I think you had to drive me to the first practice. I don't think I had my car yet. Yeah, you're right. And uh, I sat in your parents' kitchen. I can remember this like it was yesterday. I sat in your parents' kitchen. You played Brotherhood on like a cassette player, and I wrote the lyrics right there in that. Oh, really? Holy yeah. Fuck, and dude. it's I'm funny like, enough. Yeah. Funny enough. I remember uh, that. Yeah. Some of the influence for that song was Craig. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So and so and it worked really well because I walk in the door. And I'd never sang in a band before, never really had any experience doing it. And we played Brotherhood, and the lyrics fit really well. And, yeah. and you I mean, sang was, in Trip Face? I sang in Trip, in Trip Face. Face. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I think Brotherhood might be my favorite song. And we were Godhead at the time, because yeah. I was all about Burn. Burn song, yeah. Chaka Malik Harris, hopefully I pronounced his name correctly, was like a huge vocal influence to me. Yeah. They got and back I was together, like, you right? You can tell, They're man. back together, yeah. yeah. And that was, when we first started playing. That like, was my, that's yeah. all... Like Did how I was on stage. Record? Yeah, it's not bad. Okay. And I saw them. They played Albany probably about six months ago. It still sound good, man. I mean, the, uh, the guitar player for that band is probably one of the greatest New York hardcore guitar players, Gavin. It's they're so intricate. Yeah, I mean, just on there. it's always hard. Like when you get back together, like for a band, especially like you know we were talking about like at the drive-in. Certain bands that just refuse put out a record after like seventeen years. Um, so it's hard to capture that, you know, like, so, so when you're watching burn play up by you, does that, st- does that it, give you the bug? It sometimes it does. I've, I've, I've seen them before where it gave me the bug a little bit. Um, a band I love another huge influence on me was judge. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. Um, and I was really nervous cause that was a band I never thought would get back together. And that was a band I was, um, I missed, see, you know, I saw Burn a bunch of times. I'd never gotten to see Judge. I think the one time I was supposed to go see Judge, somebody's car broke down and I didn't get to see him. Uh, so when they reunited for the Black oh, and Blue Oh, to be Mold, young. <laughs> that was um, kind of like nerve wracking for me, as weird as this is like to say. And I wasn't going to go. And my wife's like, you got to go. My wife, way more hardcore than I have ever been. Um, <laughs> shout out to Lindsay Knockout. Um, <laughs> so... So, you know, she convinces me to go. I hate big fests, and I also hate big, like, I like shows where there's 50 people. I don't like shows where there's, like, 300 people. Webster Hall, right? Yeah, dude. Huge. They, like, first note, he starts singing, and it was, like, literally, I was 16 again. I haven't seen him since then because I'm afraid that's not going to happen again. <laughs> but I was, like, and then I turn around, and my wife is, like, brutally honest. I'm, like, was that as good? And she's, like, totally as good. As yeah. like you thought it was. So some bands do that for me. Some bands don't. You know, I took a real long hiatus from hardcore about two or three years. Before we go there, did, did you watch the Vice piece? That oh, yeah. Did? That's beautiful. It's great. Yeah. Right? I mean, and it's, it's like six those, pieces. Right? Those six things parts? I want to hate. I'm like, oh, that's so cheesy for a hardcore band. And they did it so well. And that band has such like a mystique around it that it's like, oh, my God, this is really cool. Like I get I get goosebumps talking about yeah. it because like it really like they did it right. Like and they're still playing. And everybody I talked to is like saw them last month and they were amazing. So some bands can do it. Some bands can't can't. And I think it has less to do with the talent of the band and more to do where the people are in their lives at that point. You know, yeah, because the, for a band like that, the audience needs to be really kind of engaged yeah like we talked about earlier you want to relive yeah yeah definitely you know like if you go and like 
people are there. Like, if you go see, like, uh, we were talking about Psychedelic Furs, and everyone's just standing there, yeah, but, like, if you go see Judge, and it's, like, yeah, and 500 people that are just, like, staring at their phone. <laughs> and I've I've been to those reunions where that happens, and it's, like, I have, like, Sam I Am, which is a band I really like. Oh. And they've Does start- he know that how much I love Sam? <laughs> no, it's one of dude. Guy, right one here, of my. Man. So I saw them at the Wetlands oh, in '94, so and blew. They blew my mind. They were like one of my favorite bands. Now, from what I hear, they're really good. But I went to go see them in Brooklyn. I think Lindsay and I went to I was see there. them, and they were really drunk. When? <sighs> Saint Vitus. It wasn't St. Vitus. Okay, so it was they probably played wherever. the Williamsburg Music Hall. Yes. Yeah. And they were really bad. Yeah. And I was like, this. And it was one of those things, like, we drove down from Dutchess County, we had to get babysitters, you know, two tickets, and we were Much so better mad. Now. They, That's they, what they I've They heard. got rid of the, the bass player and the drummer. Um, they got rid of those two, and, and they got a drummer that kills it. And the bass player, same thing. I, th- I think he plays in... Fuck, I forget what band, but like, I think that they've been taking a little bit more serious. I think that they were a little bit loose back then, yeah. and like, they weren't releasing records, and they were just kind of playing one offs and stuff like that. I saw them a few times, and they were amazing, and then I saw them a few times where it was just like, eh. Yeah. You know, I gotta so. get into these. They're, yeah. Everybody I know for loves me, them. The for song, me, they're your favorite band's favorite band because, um, like, for my band, anytime someone says my band sounds like Sam I Am. Favorite band? Uh, who? They're enslaved favorite band. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> like I get like anytime someone says, "Oh, your band sounds like uh, Super Chunk or Sam I Am," either one of those two, like my dick grows yeah. like yeah. <laughs> one inch. <laughs> so. Well, I, I I got dragged the first time I saw them. Um, I had no idea who they were, and my friend Aris was just like, "Hey, you want to go to a show with the Wetlands?" Blah blah blah. I think they played with like Weston, you know, some show like that. And I was so blown away. And then I got their seven inch with too many buttons. And to me, I will still argue that's one of the greatest songs ever written. Um, and yeah, huge. But that's a band there. Like, what's your favorite album? Oh God, name the albums. Um, well, my favorite is Astray. Oh, that's sure. the one that has Sunshine, Mud Hill. Yes. Yeah. But then the other ones are like Clumsy. Clumsy is actually my favorite. Okay, it's probably Clumsy my favorite is, record. Is their um, major label debut? Yep. So they got signed to Atlantic around the same time that um, Bad Religion, and then there was another band that got signed to a major. So, um, yeah, I guess it didn't really work out for them because yeah. I think maybe Jawbreaker, Never works. Jawbreaker, might have been Jawbreaker, Bad Religion, and uh, Sam I Am were the three they got signed. So, and it, I think it only worked out for Bad Religion. As I've shown in previous lists, I'm really bad with albums. I'm a seven inch guy. It yeah. might be ADHD. I don't know. Yeah. Four songs, enough for me. That list represented, man. I yeah. Stand by. Um, I, it yeah. Was good. So uh, yeah. So you just, you guys start playing and and doing your thing and like so so from Godhead to Trip Face. Like, how, when did you guys change the name? So I think we changed the name after. I went away to school. Yep. And. Did you go to Binghamton. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, those dudes carried on, and I think. Probably around then you became trip face. So, so okay, when Jeff was still in it, maybe. when Brian, Brian, and we had two bass players, yeah, and they kind of left when Brian left, um, and so we we're Jeff and I were like, well, we still want to play, and Jeff and I would just jam all the time. Like I would just play bass, and he would play drums, and we would like for hours, and that's really where I learned how to play bass. I'm not a very good bass player, but where I learned, you know, that's where I got my fundamentals. Um, played manic depression like 80,000 times um so we my friend Austin who had moved out from Queens he started playing guitar for us and then I started playing bass for us and then this kid Rory played guitar for us for a while um and that's when we did a live set on WUSB and that was a split with grid and that kind of got us on people's radar and we didn't even know that a lot of people yeah, it got us on a lot of people's radar. How do you um, think that happened? Just like grid. So this is the weird part of the story. So then that lineup start started getting funky, and Aust- Rory left. Austin switched the guitar. I switched to bass, and our friend Ross started singing, and we went by the name Offsides, and we started doing that. And at the same time, um, unbeknownst to us, people were getting that split tape and kind of getting into us, and we didn't know. Um, so then a bunch of us got arrested for graffiti 
What year was by the uh, way? this? Was ninety four? Ninety four. Ninety four. So a bunch of us got arrested for graffiti and got put on a, a curfew, a court ordered curfew. And honestly, it might be the best thing that ever happened to me become because I became a straight A student. Yeah. Because my lawyer was like, the only way you're not going to jail is if you become a straight A student and get into college. Oh, so it was either the shit. military right. or college. And my mom's like, you're becoming a straight A student. And I was like, fuck it, I'll become a straight A student. Um, so like for a couple months, I wasn't allowed to go to shows. Grid played with VOD at the angle, and that was the tape they were giving out. So that kind of got us noticed as well. And then, so we started playing, um, we started kind of doing basement shows out east as trip I played with again. you guys one more time. Yep. I came home from school. VOD at Mackey's basement. At Mackey's basement. In so we, we never, weird. like, <laughs> we weren't part of the Long Island scene. Mm-hmm. Like, even, I started going to shows in 91, and we were going to the city. And that's like the, if you, the East End crew was like the East End crew. Like we didn't really know any any of those guys. We didn't meet Artie or any of those guys. Tension didn't pour out. No, but and there was a, I have some funny tension stories. <laughs> there was some graffiti beef between that crew oh. and our crew. Um, shout out to NRP. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, which was really weird. And then shout out to Tension. Became friends with those guys. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So, talked to Joe about doing the show too. Yeah, yeah, dude, good guy to have He's on. Cut my hair tomorrow. So uh, maybe I should get my hair cut by him. Um, so in order for us to get to a show in the city, we would take a bus from Riverhead to Port Jeff. Then we would get on a train in Port Jeff, a diesel train in Port Jeff, get to the city, go to a show oh, yeah, in the city, Jesus. and then we'd miss our train. So if we caught our train, we'd take the train back to Port Jeff and sleep in Port Jeff, like outside if it was warm. Meanwhile, our parents think we're all sleeping over each other's houses, um, or we'd sleep in Penn Station. One of the first times we slept in Penn Station, we met Tyler King, ah. who was huge for Trip Face, and I don't even think Tyler remembers meeting me then. Um, met some of the guys from Still Suit hanging out in Penn Station one night. I don't know who Tyler King um, is. It, King he, size booking. King size booking. He was huge for Long Island and Trip Face. So we kind of didn't connect with the Long Island scene for a really long time. Um, I think the uh, first Long Island show I might have gone to was Life Agony at the Angle. That was the first time I saw Disciplinary Action, um, which was on my list. Oh, man. I remember them playing, and the the crowd was exactly what you wanted a hardcore show to look like. It was a bunch of bald kids beating the crap out of each other with flight jackets and just smashing each other. I don't know if that's my... Uh... Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> back then, that was you know that's what you wanted to see, and yeah. DA was so intense. Um, and then Life of Agony was amazing, and I also bought the Neglect demo at that show, and that kind of introduced us a little, got us a little bit more into Long Island Hardcore. We went to see 411 at the Holbrook Civic Center, which was really just like a little VFW hall. It's the first time I saw Scapegrace, which is, to me, that's still one of the best that Long Island is, bands. Uh, fuck, who sang for that? Steve. 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 Yeah. Uh, best, yeah. best front man, like best Long Island front man, one of the best. Um, and then there was a random show out in the Hamptons that Grid played with Crossfade, another band. I know their demos on YouTube. They were this technical death metal band from Mastic, like back at like 93, 94, um, early slam death metal. And we loved them. Like a lot of my friends, I was the hardcore kid who got all the metal heads into hardcore. And then all the metal heads got me into metal. Um, so we went to see them in Grid. And there was these two random bands on the show. Um, the first band was Loyal to None, oh, which yes. was Brian, who went on to do, um, he went on to do play guitar in Millhouse, and then Brian Smith, yep. who played drums in Coercion. And I thought they were awesome. Uh, Brian had a, um, a skate, I can't remember what skateboarder, but had a skateboarding graphic tattoo. So I thought he was the coolest guy in the world. <laughs> um, I remember Loyal to None because, and and I don't know one song of theirs, but I just knew that they were on the flip side of the VOD. VOD split. VOD split. Yeah. Yeah, that, and that might have been their best. They always suffered from bad recordings. That yeah. was their best. That was yeah. their best. That, um, that got like take the mat like everything on there was fucking so goddamn yeah. good and no bass player yeah nope. yeah weird um and then the band after Loyola Nunn was one of somebody from here was talking about how drummers you were talking about yeah. how drummers really yeah. it was all bass players for me and this band got up there and the singers like really intelligent you know I was so used to kind of goony hardcore where everybody's got shaved heads it's all about you want you want your singer to look like he's gonna rip a baby's head off you know really <laughs> intense and this guy gets up there and he looks like this normal guy he had on like the classic 90s kind of like 
workers, blue shirt buttoned up, a little too baggy, and he's really intelligent. You can tell his lyrics are really intense. His between song banter is really intense, and the bass player's just got this groove, and it was mind over matter. Mm. Uh-huh. And I was just like, this was like, <laughs> this was like, oh, now I want to go to Long Island shows. Yeah. Because I kind of saw, you know, it was the age of SIB. It was the age, you know, disciplinary action, neglect. There was a lot of fighting. There was some white power skinheads that were, thank God, were getting pushed out of the scene. But it was pretty violent. And it was cool to see these two bands that were relatively intelligent and kind of on the same, you know, we were super into like hip hop and kind of being, you know, we were listening to X-Clan and, you know, Public Enemy and, yeah. and burn bands like Burn. Um, the Trip Face guys were super into... Um, Okay, Four Walls Falling, which was from Atlanta, and yep. super political lyrics with a lot of groove to them. And here was a Long Island band. Between them and Skate Grace, we we're like, oh, maybe there's something to like this Long Island scene. So from there, I think we made friends with George, um, and then we started going to more Long Island shows. And then all of a sudden, Artie was just like, oh, you're that band Trip Face from the split with Grid. And we're like, yeah. And that's how we kind of got pulled into starting to play. Shout out to Artie. For yeah, it. shout out to Artie. I got to say, he... Uh... His podcast definitely was one of the ones that inspired me to do it. So he does, like every now and then, he'll do one with this dude, Ron Grimaldi. Yeah, Ron's of, a good guy. Out of, um, of course, everyone knows Ron. Yeah. Out of uh, St. Vitus, his bar. Yeah. So it's fun, man. He, I think there's like seven or eight episodes up. There's one with Sam I Am. Oh, really? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and it's awesome. I think the new one is with Mutoid Man, but I don't think he put it up yet. So, so yeah, so we kind of got hooked in with those guys. Uh, by that point, Trevace had completely dissolved. Everybody had pretty much gotten into the rave scene, except for me. So I'm like all alone with like Brian from Grid. What and year did the, did the, you guys break up? I want to say 94, like my senior year of high school, because you might have played a show with us with Brian Grid playing drums. I the, After I left for school, I came back for that in that one. I don't that know if somebody show. didn't oh, no, show up or Jeff, something. Jeff played, I think. Jeff we, and me were in the driveway, and somebody I didn't. think Austin couldn't get out of his house. Yes. He wasn't allowed out. So we played. I remember we were high as hell. Yeah. That's where that's but, where the name came from. Yeah. Oh, it was it? <laughs> oh, yeah, because those dudes. I mean, I'm this, like, straight-edge farm kid, and I, like, I think in some ways I was straight-edge because, like, I had no choice. Um, and, you know, I hung out with No these. one made a drug delivery? No, well, uh, actually, that's not true. Most we had an of, interesting dynamic. Yeah, it was, I, I was more my mom than anything else. She kept uh, me straight. You actually listened to your mom. Yeah, I did. I did. Not some, all the time. Some people Smart. actually did. And, yeah. like, for, it's funny. I, I, I don't know what, what, you know, the connection is, but I find that fascinating. You know, some people that I know definitely don't want to disappoint their parents. And, like, I'm, like, the opposite. Not that I wanted to, but whatever they wanted me to just do. Just sort of happened. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it just so happened to everything I decided to do with my life. Yeah. <laughs> Disappointed them in some way. Yeah, and so so everything kind of dissolved. Um, and Jay May um, was doing, he was in Jeff's Metallica cover band. And then they alternate re- exit, alternate exit. Yeah. And they replaced <laughs> Jeff. Right. I forgot. They kind of replaced that? Jeff uh, when Jeff know. left with Pete Rowland, who became right. the drummer of Trip Face. Um, so, you know, the, I went away to college, went to Adelphi, um, was just into going to shows. I was literally just like into going to shows. I did a zine and that I was pretty happy with that. What was the name of the, zine? Uh, uh, the first issue I called it new Jack. And then after that it was called bystander. And so I was in, I was more into that and I was more into taking pictures and just going to shows. But Jay started doing sound at most of the shows. And one day Jay walked up to me and was just like, dude, I've got a really good drummer. Um, why don't we start trip face again? And it was weird. Cause Jay was always kind of like a heavy metal dude and he was just getting into hardcore, but I knew he was incredible on guitar mm. and I knew Pete was a really good drummer. And at the time, um, Dave Allen, who became the bass player, him and I were friends I uh, hung out in Mastic a lot. Um, my, one of my best friends growing up, Rob Deskin, who should be listening to this, um, he split time between his mom and dad, between Mastic and Riverhead. And Mastic had a little bit more of a scene when it came to skating. Yep. Hardcore was easier to take the train, get Taco Bell, and then walk over, take the train in the city to go to shows. Oh, let me take this thing off right here. Um, yeah, so you said Jay wanted to start a band with you, right? Yeah, well, he basically wanted to kind of start doing trip face yeah oh i could hear myself sorry god and uh so i had my friend dave who had been interested in playing and he was a really ridiculously good bass player had this crazy five string bass and was super he actually i think he was trying to join crossfade 
And so it all kind of clicked because now we, you know, we had enough of, we had enough of the influence from the past and also everybody was really proficient at their instrument. Um, and I think that kind of, I hate to sound cheesy, but it kind of took us to that next step. Um, and Jay and Dave were really able to add a melodic element to the music that already had, thanks to Jeff and Pete, kind of this... It, had a groove. Yeah, had a groove. And oh, I was definitely all had, about... Definitely had a groove. Like, I, for me, like, when I listen back to the to that stuff, like, the, the, the you said the discography or, like, the compilation that you put out, um, it's definitely, like, I could hear, like, a kind of like somewhere between neglect and silent majority yeah and that was we wanted to kind of bridge a little bit of everything yeah um and you know i at that time i was kind of getting out of new york hardcore um and started to get in into bands like born against and rorschach um and that was starting to influence me a little bit it was a little bit noisier a little right? noisier a little bit more of the abc no rio stuff yeah. and scape grace of course and half man definitely noisy. there was some long island bands that were noisier so that was influencing me a little bit um and also it was the 90s and you know this that it was the time of giant pants and <laughs> basketball jerseys <laughs> Um, Yo, basketball shout out to jer- Jenko. Yeah, I was yep. gonna say basketball jerseys through the roof. Yeah, yeah. through the roof and uh, visors, visors, chain wallets, chain wallets, yeah. and you know, I still got one. Everybody right. was doing something a little different. Krishna beads. Krishna, uh, huge. I don't know how I, br- I don't know how I could breathe back then. <laughs> um, they were so tight on my neck, um, and so it was cool. And you know, not to sound like every. Long Island hardcore person from 96, 97, but you could walk into a show and hear every different spinoff of hardcore all in the same night. We did a show there with Earth Crisis, um, and I had gotten really into stuff like Cavity and Floor, um, really droning, grindy stuff that almost was percussive, didn't sound necessarily like me music especially to the guys in trip face who had to hear it at two in the morning when i was driving the bus i'd be like oh god <laughs> and you know there was floor <laughs> jokes and that that band's gone on become more of a melodic you know very the band floor the band floor uh check out their early stuff it's it, it makes it's to me amazing i think to you it might just sound like noise um but uh so we got to play with them and i didn't even know it we were playing a show at the at the PWAC with Earth Crisis, and all of a sudden, you know, early in the show, it's like six o'clock. The first band goes on, and all of the windows in the PWAC started shaking. And someone in interface joked, "What is that floor?" And somebody else goes, "No, that's actually floor. They're playing. They jumped on the show. It was like the greatest moment of my life." <laughs> and me and Andrew from Black Army Jacket stood in this giant empty room, like completely, like fanboying and like getting into this band and i was just like holy shit i got to play with Flo- like floor trip face and floor two totally different worlds but you know and everybody kind of fed off of that influence so you'd go see um you know you, you'd go see these bands that were more melodic you'd see these bands that were like indie rock and you kind of fed off of that and jay may and pete were talented enough that they found some way to we'd get into a band and they'd go oh they'd find a way to be influenced by it not rip it off but they would add it to the songs we all fanboyed bloodlet when bloodlet first came out that was like which was weird because half those dudes were half of trip face was christian and they got super into bloodlet which i thought was hilarious um and that was a you can you can hear in our later songwriting where bloodlet became like a big influence to us um, and those guys just were so amazing at their instruments that they could just kind of borrow and meld and make it work. Um, and, you know, it was great. And it was a, it was a great time. You know, you had the PWAC, you had Exit Records. Um, we became friends randomly with Indecision one day. Um, we They played, I think, with Grid. I don't even know if we played shout or not. Tom Sheehan. To, shout out to Tom. Um, they played at the right track in with Grid. And we were kind of like, whoa, this band's pretty cool. And, you know, that was back in the day where if there was a phone number inside the 7-inch, yeah. <laughs> you called that phone number. And Justin and I became literally became friends via the phone. And he would leave messages. I went to Pace University for a year. And he would leave him playing acoustic versions of 
like Cure and Suzy and the Banshee songs on my on my ta- I wish I had it ha- on my taped like answering machine. And that's we became him and I became friends because we both loved eighties music. Um, Funny so- how those bands like still have. Um, or just any band in general, because like when I talked to Tom like via Facebook, he, like we were talking about Elliot Smith and Lemonheads, yeah, you know, and these are bands that we love and and influence us. But yet, when when we play, that's not what it sounds like, you know. But it's like we still take that influence somehow. But in my brain, yeah, it, like I always joke when people start talking to me about Trevis, I'm like, I'm like outside of Burn. Nine Inch Nails, Pretty Hate Machine, yeah, huge yeah. lyrical influence. We used to cover Boys Don't Cry. Yeah, we covered I... Boys Don't Cry. Yeah. I mean, we, we huge. Yeah. You know, it's really funny. Like Sheer Terra did. Yeah. yeah, like Sheer. Yeah, like Sheer Terra did. <laughs> a few people pointed that out. Yeah. Um, but that's you know we, we. I think Long Island, Long Island. I was joking with my mom today as we were driving to the um, Airplane Museum, which is close to here. Um, so Long Island is so compressed. It's long, you know, the joke, it's Long Island, but it's also, you know, there was no, it, when kids go to show when shows in Albany, they can go out, you know, you can go to Syracuse, you can go to Binghamton, you can go down in the city, you can drive anywhere. There wasn't a lot of that on Long Island. You couldn't, I mean, you could get on, we got on the ferry and played shows in Boston, but there was, you couldn't really go anywhere. So Neglect could play every weekend. I mean, I saw Neglect, I think once three days in a row. <laughs> um, there was really not it was hard to get off the island to go to shows so it was just every night it was like there's a show at the PUAC there's a show here there's a show at a VFW um and you know so that kind of got the crowd going but it also got the weird influences because you started a band with who you could yeah so Jamie was super into hair metal and you (laughs) can hear that in trip face songs um you know without a doubt my lyrics were super sappy and about girls and that wasn't really a normal hardcore thing. Um, and I know that resonated not, with some not people. Not until later. Like, I think like two or three yeah, years. Yeah, two or three years. It like was, once it, the movie life came yeah, out. Yeah, once the movie life. <laughs> um, you know, so, but it was because you got you a had singer. You find who play. like I know in my town and your town is yeah. the same way. It's like, all right, there was two drummers. So that was <laughs> like, all right, that <laughs> guy or that guy. And then he likes that and you work together. You know, so, yeah, you know, yeah. you see a band like Silent Majority, you know, those guys were super into you too. And you, you, you don't hear it necessarily oh i hear but, it but you see you, you do hear it like it's there i it's, love rich's playing yeah and you just you can you can feel it neglect you could tell those dudes were into death metal and but it still worked and what was awesome is you go to a show and neglect's playing with silent majority you guys talked about our record release kill your idols opened our record release mm. so we could play with you know here's trip face which is like metally 90s hardcore with sappy lyrics playing with kill your idols which at the time was just it sounded like negative approach yep. it was amazing and then those bands didn't fight with each other they all influenced and hung out with each other and that's made it those huge crowds come out and plus you're stuck on this island huge crowds huge i mean I, we did a record release for the seven inch and i think i would have been happy with like 100 kids and it was like 400 kids and I remember getting up on stage and being like, what the hell is going on with my life? Because all of a sudden I'm playing to all these people. And it's like all I ever wanted, my goal when I was in a band was to play CBGBs with Warzone, which we later on did. <laughs> but that's all I wanted. Yeah. Um, and it was just kind of playing to these huge crowds. What year did you play with, with Warzone? Up there? Uh, I want to say 96. And we played after Warzone and it was really embarrassing. How the fuck did that happen? T- they, Tyler <laughs> wanted us to go on after them because he was afraid the Long Island kids were going to leave. Okay. Ray told me it was okay. And Ray could have told me, like, walk down the street and get him a six pack. And I would have done it in a second. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I mean, it was just a really cool and interesting time. We played the Medford VFW. That was our first show where I was like, wow, my band might do something. And we played with Grid, and I know a couple other Long Island bands were on it. I don't remember which bands they were. We made the stage, um, and it was like 200 kids packed in that VFW and going nuts. And then at the end of the show, we didn't set up a merch table because we didn't think anybody cared. And I got followed outside, and I had to open up one of those old suitcases that held tapes and we maybe had like 30 demos and we sold out of them in like five minutes. What were you selling demos for then? Like, I was like three a bucks. dollar. Yeah. I think it was a dollar. <laughs> um, and I was like, like this, this might go somewhere. And it, and it did. Yeah. Um, in some ways did that you guys ever tour, we did like a 
seven days down to Florida with indecision. Okay. Um, and we played a lot of weekends. I'm very proud of the fact I maintained a 3.8 GPA <laughs> while playing almost every weekend in a different city. Nice. Um, and, you know, that that's, that's where things started to get weird um, because I didn't know it at the time but have really bad social anxiety. And I can't handle a lot of people and I especially can't handle a lot of attention. Mm. So... And I had no idea at this point in my life. At this point in my life, you know... Uh, I relate to that, the, the attention. Yeah. Like I sing in a band. freaked me out. I, unfortunately, no one comes to see us, but... Yeah. <laughs> Just it, saying. It, it, it was weird, and it came out of nowhere. And, you know, later on, I learned in life, you know, I went to see a doctor, got everything figured out, right. um, and I deal with it now because I have a job where there it is a little high-profile um, exercise and that's why when i was younger and i was skateboarding and i was doing the band you know we were playing to 30 people packed in a room mm -hmm. i still had skateboarding as that physical activity by 96 97 all i was doing was music and hanging out with my girlfriend um and that really fed into it and i joked upstairs why trip face break up i was a terrible person to be in a band with i was um before we would play and if it was a big show i'd get hit with a massive anxiety attack I had no idea what it was. I'd never seen a doctor. All I know is my heart rate would go up. I'd get super dizzy. The walls would kind of close in on me mm -hmm. and fight or flight would kick in and I couldn't run because I had to play a damn show. And I was just a terrible person to be around. How would that come off to the band though? Like what would they you just, I mean, I felt bad. They just, I was just a moody, angry dick. And, um, and it was weird because I would How be, old were you at this point? I want to say I was 20, 21, yeah. um, and I was straight edge, so I wasn't dealing with, you know, there was nothing. Right. You know, I think most guys would have a beer, yeah. smoke a joint, and they'd be fine. And I just had no idea what was going on with me. I mean, I literally would feel like I was having a heart attack. And from, Did you feel like you were going to die? Yeah. I, I get that, and you're going to laugh where? When I don't drive. When I don't drive, really? I get, and it just hap started happening within, like, the last five years. Um and I remember my mom would kind of be like that. And I kind of feel like somehow it passed on to me. So if I'm not driving, I'm constantly in fear that I'm going to die. Well, which that, is fucking weird. Imagine that feeling before playing any show. Yeah. I can't even I can't even imagine at all. So it was really, and that's why I prefer, I always preferred playing bass. Um, and that's why a lot of bands later on there, I think I was in two bands that later on I switched from singing to playing bass because it was... Didn't, I didn't get that anxiety if I was playing bass. If I could hide behind that bass, I was fine. Um, and then, so, you know, we'd play, and I was still an angry kid. I had some stuff happen to me when I was younger, and music was my outlet, and probably also why, you know, my anxiety manifested itself in its way, and maybe there was a connection. So, you know, I'd get on stage, and I was fine. But then, as time went on and we played more shows, the anxiety didn't go away when I was on stage. And here, there's pictures that I look back at where we're playing to 400 kids and it should be like the time of my life. And I should be like, all these kids are screaming my words back at me. This should like make me feel like the greatest man on earth. And I look in the back of the club and I'd see the one person with like their arms crossed, like shaking their head. Cause there's always somebody who doesn't like your music. Absolutely. You know, Neil Rubenstein would be on the corner of the room mm -hmm. and I could see Neil like shaking his head. And that's all I could think about for the rest you of the show. You know, we're talking to him tomorrow, right? Uh, are you? That's hilarious. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that, that's what you mentioned. Him. Yeah, no, no, no. no. <laughs> so, uh, and, and shout out to Neil. Neil and I are, are buddies now. Um, so, you know, and then the scene drama, which happens no matter what, would start playing in. And I was just miserable. The last year of that band, I, I didn't want to do it anymore. What year was that? 97. 97. And, um, and here we are, you know, we're... we're uh, I forgot the name of it. So we're on Exit, which is like the biggest, you know, almost the biggest New York label at the time. Fairly successful. We're getting offered tours. We did weekends with like Marauder. We did a weekend with Earth Crisis. Things are really working out for us. And I'm kind of just miserable. Um, I was in a band called Coercion where I got to play bass and it was a more grindy band. It had a political slant to it. I felt way more comfortable with that. But then I had to quit that because the Trip Face guys wanted me to kind of concentrate on Trip Face. And it started to kind of get real. Uh, I know that we were talking to Victory, um, and then there was a subsidiary of TVT that Tyler, at this point, Tyler King, uh, to bring him back from the, you know this random older hardcore dude I met one night and thought was the coolest guy in the world in Penn Station, 
he somehow checks us out and decides he's going to be our manager. He's the whole reason why anybody knew really Tripface existed. He got us on all these weekends. He got us on all these shows. Um, and, you know, he he was happy with us on Exit, but the whole time he's like, I want to get you on a bigger label. And understandably, Jay and Pete and Dave, they want to make this a living. They want to do this. These guys are talented guys. They want to and they kind of want to take it to the next level. Yeah. And, you know, I was miserable to begin with because my anxiety. Um, I was going to school full time. I was super serious about my school. Um, so were you like bailing on shows or just not like... bailing? Never would bail on shows, but just. I but wasn't... I'm saying like if like an offer came up, you'd be like, I don't want to. No, do I'd figure it out. Yeah. I'd figure it because I never can let anybody down. Yeah. Um, but I was not, you know, I those guys put up with pretty much, I wouldn't say diva behavior, but I would just like, like we get to the show and I just walk off. I check out the town by myself. Just wasn't fun to be in the band with. Mm. And so those guys were leaning towards some of the more metal labels that were looking at us. I wanted victory because I still, I needed to still be a legitimate hardcore kid, mm -hmm. even though, you know, I was listening to like Human Remains and Brutal Truth, you know, Brutal Truth, super into like grindy stuff, but I still needed to maintain that cred, which, you know, I probably was faking it a little bit. And especially at that time, victory, yeah. victory was like right there, man. Yeah. Like that was like the beginning of... You know, like when Victory was about to pop. I, when did you guys sign to Victory? Or did you, no, no, they offered us. They but we offered. Yeah, 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 you were didn't, smart. Didn't, yeah, didn't you take it. <laughs> didn't take it. Well, they took the meeting without me, which pissed me off. Um, and they were smart, and they knew, but I was oblivious. You know, again, my goal was to play CBGBs with Warzone, and I did it. Um, you know, so, you know, things started to get really strained in the band. And, uh, Are you enjoying any of the live performances? Or no, just really... you know, every once in a while we play a show that I'd be into, but... Yeah. You know, there was just a lot of pressure and a lot of drama. Um, and where, then, where did you see like the end result? So you figured you were in this band. Did you just want to quit, and you just didn't know how to? I, I wanted to quit, but I didn't want to let anybody down. Yeah, okay. But I also didn't want to quit because then if I quit, they'd go on without me, which is a weird. Mm. It's almost like you want to break up with the girl, but you can't because yeah. you know she'll have a new boyfriend <laughs> after. Yeah. And that, you know, that kind of happened with that band. But uh, <laughs> and a better looking and better singing girlfriend after. Or boy, uh, that was your baby anyway. too, man. Yeah, you were, it was my you baby. Were grind of all these members that went through it, I went through. And the there whole was a thing. lot. You know? Yeah, and, and you grinded it out you know and you know there was a lot of conflicting things i was going to school in connecticut i was working in the school district up in connecticut um it was just a lot of pressure and a lot of things going on and it just made that anxiety worse and on top of that i didn't want to be straight edge anymore um i'm not a big drinker i don't drink now my wife is straight edge um but i didn't want that and that was a big part of that band so there was that added pressure and then you know finally we played CBGBs. I said some dumb stuff. And on the mic? On the mic. Yeah. And uh, understandably insulted those guys. Oh. And, you know, I didn't ride home in the van. I rode home with my friend Mike. And my friends from home were kind of pressuring me. They wanted to see me more. Um, you said stuff on stage about I said stuff on stage. I literally said before we played Brotherhood, I said, this is a cover of a band I used to be in. Oh. And after I was like, you know, on the ride home, I was just like, holy shit, what is wrong with me? Like, why would I, why, you know, I didn't understand my own behavior when like I would do that. self-sabotage. Yeah, it was like self-sabotage. Get the ball rolling. And, uh, you know, it's, we, we went home and it was, you know, radio silence for like a week. And then, you know, my mom yells downstairs, hey, Jay May is on the phone. And I, I no, it might've been Dave, it might've been Jay, I'm not really sure who. And they're like, and right before he was about to say, I was like, I quit, dude. And he's like, well, you don't have to quit because we're kicking you out of the band. And I was just like, whatever, but this is my band. If you're going to go forward, you can't play Brotherhood. You can't play, you know, th these songs, blah, blah, blah. We kind of went back and forth. Um, and then, you know, there was money in the band account because we were smart. Oh. And I was just like, listen, I have money invested into the recording studio. And Jay was just like, listen, I'll buy you out because I don't want you involved in it. And, you know, I showed up at his house and he handed me probably about 700 bucks, 800 bucks and went and bought a new BMX bike. And that was it, you know, and Pete and I stayed friends because we both went to school together and we were roommates. But, you know, it was it was what did those guys do after. So they kind of tried some stuff without me. And then they started a band called Advent with Tommy Corrigan singing. OK. And it was good stuff. And, you know, it was it hurt. You know, Pete came home. One, you know, one weekend he came home and he was just like, 
calls me into his room and he's like, yo, I'm going to play some stuff for you. And he played it. And I'm like, well, that's obviously Tommy singing. And that's some songs that we were working on. But, you know, I can't be mad. I can't be upset because at this point I was having a really good time with my life and, you know, was uh, in a good, kind of a good place. You know, um, I'd reconnected with my friends at home, had friends at college, uh, was working in a library and I loved that, was working in the school district, running an after school program, loved that, got super involved in activism, did uh, some work with the Catholic workers in Hartford, worked at a soup kitchen. Did you kinda, take any more pictures or? I didn't get back into photography, which was, wasn't until later, but, um, you know, just kind of was reorganizing my life towards the stuff I really wanted to do. When, when you quit, did you did you feel an instant sense of relief? No. That, did you no. get back to, like, that was the primary source of, and you could get more relaxed, or was, you still had? Within you know, a week, within a week, I had broken up with the girl that almost every Trip Face song is about. <laughs> um, had quit my band that I had been in, you know, for years. Um, and then going to see you DJ at some seafood bar in Hampton Bays. Um, beach, broke, shout out to the beach bar. Yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> broke edge. Yeah. And my life did... Was Brian spinning a uh, Josh Wink? I, I don't even know what he was playing. <laughs> Hip hop, probably. Hip hop, probably. Yeah. yeah. Knowing the river. So you, bro- you broke edge. Huh? And had, you know, I was thinking about this in the ride here, um, would not tell myself not to do it. Um, probably had the best summer of my life was supposed to go on tour with Indecision and Silent Majority to the West Coast, um, but instead stayed home and made up for years of being straight edge. And it was fun and a great time. I basically lived a movie. All I did was worked in a record store, a Tanger yeah. Outlets. Best jobs I've ever had. Um, Wait, mu- uh, Music Matters? Music, music Matters. I helped managed open that, that store. store for a minute. <laughs> I helped open that store. Got <laughs> right s- before it went out of business. Yeah, got super. <laughs> that was you. That was me. Um, <laughs> Got super into Slater Kenny and got super into At the Gates. Nice. And, at the and gates. just, you know, drank probably a little bit too much, but hung out with my friends from high school. Is Slater Kenny on the list? It is not on my list, but it might, it should have been. Um, a lot Powers of Sepultura. Music yes. Matters yes. With you? Yeah. yeah me and, too. Uh, <laughs> you know, just had a really good time and kind of, and that's where my anxiety started to kind of go away. I kind of, you know, all that pressure of being in a band, all that pressure of being straight edge. I stayed vegan, even though the rumors were for that I went meat eater i stayed vegan um but just like hung out with my friends and had a good time and kind of probably lived you know that that freshman year of college that i didn't live because i was going to shows playing in a band and just had you know went to a lot of parties and had a really good time and yeah my all that pressure kind of went away over that summer and you know slaughter of the soul taking away all that stuff that you you uh you didn't have to live up to or, yeah. or, or, you know, the straight edge or being that singer or that figure or yeah. whatever, and just doing whatever it was you wanted awesome. to for once. It was awesome just to have all of that yeah. pressure gone. I didn't have, you know, three other guys who needed me every weekend and needed me at practice, you know, and, and there was a lot of pressure because those guys, there's a song burden, mm-hmm. which is, you know, a lot of people like that song. I always say that's the song where I said, wow, I know the direction these guys want to go. And one, I don't know if I can do it. And two, I don't know if I want to do it. It was very almost seven dusty kind of yeah. has a groove to it's, it. It's the like when I was listening to the songs earlier today, it's the one that really kind of stuck out because it was different. Very and, different. And it was the first time I'd ever written lyrics that were fictional. And it's really weird because a lot of people thought that song was about them. And that song's about no one. Okay. And I remember sitting in my dorm room at Pace University and listening to the song and like really struggling with the lyrics and then the finished product I was just like this isn't like me this isn't every other song before that was something that I had an emotional investment in and that song I didn't and I think the lyrics are actually really strong um, and a little bit more songwriting um, but I didn't recognize it at that time it's funny and seriously like today just listening to it I was like man like out of all the songs that I heard it was the one that stood out because it was the most different. Like, yeah. It was just completely and, not like the other one. And that was the direction we were going. And that was the direction those guys were talented enough to go in. And at that time would have probably pushed them to become one of those bigger, you know, more metalish bands. But that just, it wasn't me. And um, what are those guys doing now? Do you talk I, to them? I don't. It, there's some bad blood there. So, okay. um, you know, so it, it just, it, it was a bummer because I think it was a, you know, I lost my father when I was really young, and a lot of those songs are about losing my father. 
So that's was my therapy. So I think there was also an emotional attachment there. Um, that was hard to kind of give up. And it was a big for, you know, from 17 up until 21, 22 trip face was my, was my identity and I didn't want to do it anymore. And those guys worked really hard at what they did and they wanted to. So, you know, when it was over, it was, it was tough and it was like a breakup. I was joking. It's like a breakup with a girl. Um, but you know, again, my life was a lot better after. And, you know, I was a yeah, much happier person. What you did, like everything that you just described, like you found, I mean, everything that you did sounds pretty purposeful and meaningful and everything, mm-hmm. that, you know, you have that, uh, you know, that drive to, to help people with everything that you're doing. So, you know, you just kind of flipped it from like music, you know, to, to what you're doing now. So. Pretty yeah. much, pretty awesome, man. So you yeah. Yeah, and you never went back to well, singing or well. So then, two years of kind of partying a lot, doing some political stuff, doing some volunteer work. Totally burned myself out, but it was worth it. Um, so I applied to graduate school in Albany, and of course, the only people I know in Albany are hardcore kids. So I went from like hardcore retirement like straight back in, and uh, pretty much within a month of living in Albany, I was in a band called Lariat, which was more my style, heavy. I still can't believe I got my voice to sound that way. Very in your face. His hero's gone. Hack me. Driving heavy stuff. Started doing the zine again. Started booking shows. Um, started working security. Became the typical, you know, stereotypical old hardcore dude who becomes the bouncer at the club. <laughs> and, you know, kind of had, luckily, kind of had this second life in hardcore that was really fulfilling. I did Lariat. Um, I also did a band, Burning Bridges which was more traditional hardcore. My last band was a band, um, Bulldog Courage, that I suggest everybody check out with a little bit more of an oi street influence. Uh, my friend Shane, rest you in were peace. Singing the, you were singing? I was playing bass. You were playing bass. And, uh, you know, really kind of had this second wind. And it was through that I met all of my really close friends, um, met my wife. Um, and, you know, kind of I'm really glad I got back into it because my life mm. wouldn't be where it is. And then, you know, then I started kind of having the same issues. And I said, once I was with my wife and I got married, it's when I realized like I love hardcore. I will always love hardcore, but you know, I can listen to it and then do all these other things in my life. Yeah. Absolutely love being a dad, more time to read. Um, I have a really cool job and yeah. you know, I'd, what is your actual job? I am the executive director of the Albany public library, which is a library district, which serves the entire city of Albany. We have seven branches and, uh, pretty big budget and a lot of stress but that it's shit, enjoyable that shit is official as yeah fuck. i wear a suit yeah. every day <laughs> um yeah. and my job is mostly budget which i love um which i gotta give a shout out to hardcore because that was my first experience with spreadsheets yeah. um and uh you know we libraries now do so much more than lending material you know we do shows um and you know when i started doing story time so i went to school to be a middle school teacher and then became a librarian and when I became a branch librarian, they're like, you got to do story times. And I'd never dealt with little kids, mm. but it was easy. All I did was picture a show. Was that before or after kids? This was before kids. All I did was picture a show. Like, I got to be entertaining. I got to get them to sing along. I got to get them to move a little bit. And really became really good at story time. And it was just my first few story times. It's like, go out there like it's the PWAC mm. and just get kids moving and engaged. And I could already project my voice. And I could do a really good bear voice, so I did a lot of bear stories. Um, and I fell in love with my profession through story time. And, uh, you know, now it's helpful as a dad. You know, that My kids love when I read Captain Underpants. They're totally down. They're, my kids are all about it. Captain Underpants. <laughs> it's awesome. We might go see the movie tomorrow. <laughs> my, that was his birthday party. Yeah. It was Captain Underpants. Yeah. I was the, the designated parent that went in with all that. That's awesome. <laughs> I fixed the little girl's shoes. I was on point, man. I just know Peppa Pig. That's it. Peppa Pig's good. Peppa Pig's good. (laughs) That's all I know. But what's really funny is for those two years, I wasn't really involved. I had no idea anyone even cared about the band. Like, I had no idea. We were on some victory compilation, uh, some victory TV, you have the release, DVD. yeah. Release. And I think we were, supposed to be, we were supposed to be a bigger part of it. Oh, the DVD. Yeah, release, release. That's uh, right. okay, yeah, yeah, with Brotherhood on it. Yep. And I, I had no idea about this thing. And when Lariat started touring, all these kids started talking to me about Trip Face. 
And then we're in Kentucky, and this kid's talking to me about Triffies. I'm like, how the hell do you even know we existed? <laughs> and so we ended up back at his apartment, and he's showing me this video, and I'm like, hey, this is awesome because it's a bunch of kids singing along at CBGB. So there's my dream right in front of me. And, you know, I didn't know. I didn't think anybody gave a shit. Um, you know, this was really before the Internet. The Internet was, yeah. you know, just kind of starting, just kind of out there. So to me, you know, I, I really thought it ended with our breakup, and I didn't, you know, I'd run into people. You know, and then when I was working shows or when, you know, Larry to Burning Bridges would play, we'd play Long Island and all these kids would come out and then my friends would joke and be like, they're coming out because they were into your old band. And I was just like, kind of, you know, put my hands up like, wow, okay, this is awkward, but cool. You had that show too that like, uh, you did a show down in Long Island, not a few years ago, right? Yeah. Me and Jeff were going to come to that. So then there's the reunions um yeah. which big shout out to john torn who's he in, did a trip face reunion yeah we did a couple trip face reunions without the other members and that's why there's a little bad blood oh so for years people were hammering us to do a reunion um and i was really the only one still involved in hardcore and i said not without the other dudes and there was one year pete and i what's that bar that's close to the water in jamesport that everybody used oh, to go to total Ken's place. Ken's place. So yeah. one night Pete and I went to Ken's place and I thought we were close to a reunion and we pull in, we pull into Ken's place parking lot. We didn't even get into the bar and Pete looks at me and goes, I can't do a reunion because I know it'll only be one show and it'll be like breaking up all over again. And that's where it hit me how much kind of that band meant to those guys. And I didn't, and I was like, that was a moment where I'm like, I'm going to have a beer. Cause I just realized I was a total dick. So that kind of put the kibosh on a reunion. And then um, the the guys who were in Lariat, um, Byron specifically, was like, dude, why don't you just do a reunion with a bunch of Albany dudes? And at first I was like, oh, it's kind of shitty. I don't like when people do that. Um, but then had a not so positive phone conversation with one of the other former members. And I got off the phone and I have a bad temper. And I have like a temper that will last for like a year. And I was just like, well, that was kind of a really negative interaction. So fuck that dude and got a bunch of Albany dudes together. And, you know, the first one I'm really proud of, I thought we did it justice. Yeah. And the last one, I felt like we did it justice. We did a couple other shows where some guys filled in and it didn't really work out as well. And in retrospect, I probably would have probably just done the first one and left it at that and probably should have tried a little bit harder to bridge the divide and get the original members in. But it, it was fun, and it kind of scratched an itch. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to do a band, but there was no way of starting a new band because by that time I was had a second kid on the way, and uh, yeah, it was fun. I don't regret doing it. Yeah, next time holla at your boy, yo. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, I think I talked to you about the first time. Yeah, we were, like, we, this we, guy's we, practicing scales. We, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were going to go to that show and stuff, but we got a little sidetracked, uh, Fab and I, but... Yeah. Was, yeah, but uh, it was fun. Yeah. So I know you made a list of, of your influences. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I want to hear some of those. Uh, so this was hard, and literally I think there's like five versions in my notebook. <laughs> we always uh, give our guests homework here. Yeah. So which I love. <laughs> so uh, fucking guy's a straight A student. He's got this. <laughs> yeah. yeah really. So thanks to the court ordered. Uh, <laughs> thanks to some judge in Central Islip. And justifies the means. Right? Yeah. So uh, my first is uh, number ten is suicide tendencies. Cool. For the um, self title Yeah, uh, self title I didn't know. I wasn't told I had to do albums. I was told do bands. Oh, okay, sure. So, um, but self titled, um, you know, if you saw me in seventh and eighth grade, I thought I looked like Mike Muir. So I always had the hat with the little flip. I always had a flannel with the top button button. And Brian, I'll tell you, all, I lived on a skateboard. Oh, and yeah. that was my look. That was my aesthetics. And all I listened to was like all the crossover stuff like DRI, yeah. corrosion to conformity before they got a little weird. Um, but uh, I think it's six songs with Mike singing. I think that was on constant repeat. But Suicide Tendencies was like huge because it wasn't just the music. I loved the music, but the aesthetic. Yeah. The dog, you know, my first, my first brand new, not hand me down deck was a dog town deck. And that was my socks were always up yeah. super high. They were um, Venice state yeah, culture. I mean that, that's so you were like the Long on. Island Cholo. I was, I was. <laughs> yeah. And the most, most of the Riverhead on kids On a tractor. Were, yeah. On a tractor. But it worked because we all wore flannels already. <laughs> so all we had to do was unbutton the bottom ones and just button right. the top one. And we were in. Um, um what do you think of, of their metal? 
I like I liked their metal stuff up until they got uh, the bass player. They changed bass players, mm-hmm. and they you know they got more funky. Yeah, that Robert wasn't my deal. Trulio. Yeah, oh, and, and that yeah. that's when they kind of lost me. But um, you weren't an infectious groove. Fan. Light, no, lights camera <laughs> Revo- lights camera revolution is like one of my favorite records. Fuck yeah, that's and good that's one. you know that that was a, I think that was, that was a big like soundtrack. A, yeah, that was like a perfect mixture of like. Uh, just, I think that was like right on the fence, right? right. Before they jumped, that was before yeah. the big crossover. Yeah. Cool. What's number nine? Yeah. So number nine is the Clash. Um, you know, political. Again, like you with drummers, it's me with bass players, and just those driving bass lines really got me, and I kind of like fell in love with them at an early age. That was one of my first punk bands, and really one of my first bands. And I liked the Sex Pistols, but to me, it was always about the Clash. I, well, I, not to mention, there's like one record compared to like yeah. you know i think the clash had maybe like seven records and i i like sandinista and i like big audio dynamite i mean i liked anything those guys did after all the joe strummer stuff where he kind of got more i guess country or american roots i don't know what yeah. the hell they call it all that stuff i love i love their songwriting i think their their first record's my favorite though yeah yeah the self-titled self-titled definitely like career opportunities all, all that shit. i just watched a video of them live right after the, f- the first records released i mean and those dudes like so good and so energetic and yet so tight and so the groove the drumming and bass playing the groove is so locked in you know they say the pocket yep. those guys were so, for a punk band so in the pocket and it just drove everything else great songwriting too obviously yeah. so. so uh eight I, I listened to the the podcast with george and i wish i'd known george was such a jane's addiction fan yeah and mm. i was such like in the closet about my love for jane's addiction when i was the you know singer of trip face i wish i'd known i have, could have like come out to george so we could have nerded <laughs> out about jane's addiction excuse me george i gotta tell you something <laughs> yeah um yeah jane's addiction and again there you go with the bass playing yeah, um, yeah. and Stephen avery just yeah, never Stephen came avery. back and um <laughs> you know all right but eric are you, avery, are, right? are you i mean yeah eric right. avery um, you're gonna agree that nothing shock is the yeah, best record. That's the record. Okay. I like the live Triple X record of course. a lot. Yeah, but yeah, nothing shocking. And it was bef- nothing shocking was before the Bros in the Jeeps who used to call us homophobic slurs. Then all of a sudden got into Jane's Addiction and had dreads yeah. and wanted to be our best friends. Right. Um. You know it was, that was a record before the Bros, so that always was my record. Again, great songwriting, great rhythmic drumming and incredible bass playing um so yeah it's up there so then seven is hendrix and big shout out to ross um ross's parents were um he lived the he lived about half an acre over from me he was literally my best friend growing up because he was the only other kid within walking distance of my house and his parents were super into music and they loved like that 70s jazz and all like whenever i went over to their house I didn't get into what they were playing, but it was a really cool experience. Um, and Hendrix just still to this day, I, and I don't like the sixties, but mm. Hendrix is just like, yeah, me neither. my like, guy. I don't care. Like I'll listen to the animals. I'll listen to bands like that. But there was something about Hendrix's songs because even today, like you put on fire, the wind cries Mary, like these songs, like even like taking Bob Dylan's song and yeah. making it a hundred times. Well, better. what he did, <laughs> you know, innovatively and so, that's when it comes from such a natural place. That shit is not like just sca- it's coming from somewhere else. It, and he was yeah, what like when he, you think about guitar playing and who the guitar gods were and you know or Clapton or whatever like this. This if you were live back then, this shit must have sounded like insane. Nothing you've ever insane. heard and before. I just ever. love the stories of like those guitar players watching him play and being like I just don't even yeah, understand. Out, out of yeah. this and just keeping you know, I was watching. I actually watched a video of Hendrix the other night, and he's like, "Oh, we're just gonna jam." And then they ended up playing, I think, what later on became a song. But again, being so locked in, and that's why I loved playing with Jeff. Because as a musician, you know, there's just some guys that you play with, and you're locked in with them. And no matter what you do, and especially for a drummer and a bass player, you know, most bass players just play. You know, you're basically playing rhythm guitar. Um, when you're in a hardcore band, you're just playing yeah, rhythm guitar. Yeah, definitely. And you know, I never wanted to do that when I played Maze. And there was a few guys that I played drums with. Jeff was one of them. Um, my friend Adam later on, uh, who was in Burning Bridges with me, you could, we just could look at each other and we yeah. knew, hey, we're just kind of gonna we're gonna get weird here, and it's gonna work. 
and it's like but you always find your way, way back, back to the one and it and sounds like a song it doesn't sound even. like yeah. it doesn't sound you like a guitar no. store at yeah. two in the afternoon after school's let out <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like music no matter what that yeah. drummer can lock it in yeah. and just knows where you're going we're and gonna that's... try you out after the show Park, <laughs> yeah. Park is gonna play drums and um so then diving back into hardcore number my number five? my number six. six is killing time who was known as raw uh, deal um, they were at that super bowl yeah right? dude yeah. Uh, that was that was my killer. that was my first show so in in so in effect records was this try it being a big record label off a of profile i think it was profile and they did this sampler it was a free tape so i got agnostic front i saw agnostic front anthem their video on headbangers ball and it's them playing CBGBs and then uh, riot footage from Tompkins Square Park. And I'm like, oh, my God, I need this record now, you know. So I go to Record World. I get my mom to drive me. I didn't have to ride my bike. So I get this Agnostic Front record. And in it was a way to get it. was live at CBGBs. And in it was a postcard you sent in to get the In Effect record sampler. And this sampler had Raw Deal on it, had Mad Bull on it, had 24-7 Spies, which... It's, wow. It was a really great band back then. <laughs> I um, heard that name. Enough. And Raw Deal was on it, and then Raw Deal was changing their name to Killing Time, and they were in Thrasher Magazine. And I special ordered Killing Time Brightside when it came out, rode my bike in a snowstorm to Record World to get it, and it was a CD in the lawn box, and it's in my flight jacket as I'm like, <laughs> ri- you know, riding home through the snow. The big unnecessary thing, piece of cardboard. Yeah, that well, the- but I wanted to cut it so I could put it on my wall right, so I right, couldn't right. ruin the box. Yeah, no, no, no. Right, I used to do that shit too. Yeah. Wow. And dude, that record was like, and again, it was that aesthetic. It was these guys, they were angry, they looked like they worked, you know, in, like in a mechanic's garage, mm-hmm. and, you know, a little negative, but not like sheer. Like I liked Sheer Terror, but they were a little too negative, and those guys were negative, but also like, yeah, we're negative. Life sucks, but we're gonna beat it down, and that was just super huge for man. me. Yeah. So then, uh, five is New Order. Yeah. Um, Peter Hook is the reason why I played bass. Killer bass. Player. I stayed up one night. I'm just burping in the air. <laughs> <It's> awesome. <laughs> Uh, I stayed up one night. We used to stay up and watch 120 minutes and videotape yeah. it. Young ones in 120 minutes. Oh, yeah. Um, and there was footage of New Order playing live. And Peter Hook looked like, you know, he's in this band full of very artsy guys. And he just looks like this total goon with tight leather pants. And his, wearing that bass around his Yeah, ankles. wearing his bass. And, and I'm like, <laughs> I that is the coolest man alive. Yeah. So, you know... I guess for street cred, I should say Joy Division, but I actually think New Order's better than Joy Division. I'm uh, sorry. Yeah, I, th- I, I, I think I could go with that. Yeah, and that was just that band I agree. nonstop. New Order had, I mean, uh, Joy Division had some shitty songs. You know what I mean? They Which had some classic vibe, ones. Like, but I think New Order just kind of like. And they, plus, they have a larger body of work. Yeah, to judge much from, larger body of work. Did you read his book, Peter? Yeah, Hutt? dude, it's so I heard good. he's really cunty. So he, it's so good now. <laughs> yeah. You can just, and then if you watch Control after that, you're like, Oh my God, now it all makes sense. Now it all makes sense. So four, of course, is Judge. Mm. Um, You know, Bringing It Down is, there, there, I don't, there, there's only one hardcore record better than that. And that's later on in my list, but angry, but a little emotional. Um, I got, I was in a band with Porcel for a minute um, and got to hear some great stories about Judge, but just that was a huge influence on Tripface because he had some emotional lyrics and that really touched home with me and you know kind of from the same background as me you know grew up I think on a farm you know I think you know blue collar you know parents were like truck drivers and farmers um and that spoke to me too because here's all these bands and they oh I grew up in a squat with my mom you know (laughs) and I did not I did not that didn't click but I idolized it and when I heard about Judge and read interviews I was like oh my God, this dude came from the farms in New Jersey and I came from the farms on Long yeah. Island. Mm-hmm. So I could identify really well. Awesome. Um, then number three is Husker Du. Mm. Uh, again, bass playing, um, but also just cool songwriting. You know, also uh, for me, you know, it was really cool to, um, that guitar, that that almost like it sounds like a buzz, buzzsaw guitar. Yes. Um, and, you know, kind of sappy lyrics, but emotional Bob, Bob lyrics. Mold to this day still That's great. Sugar. Yep. All well, the sugar for me, stuff. Like, you know how we were talking about Sam I Am? So growing up, like, um, I heard Sugar before I heard Husker Du. So um, Copper Blue came out, and I was probably like, 
13 or something. It's such a great record. And I heard Helpless, and I was just like, what the fuck? And it just spoke to me because it had these great guitars, which I loved because I was playing guitar at the time, but the melodies were killer. Yep. And then I went backwards, and then I got all the Husker Du stuff, and it was just like just so goddamn good from like the earlier uh, I think it was like SST stuff yeah. and then New Day Rising is yeah. it New Day Rising is now my favorite record oh yeah but my first record was Warehouse because uh-huh. they were on 120 Minutes and they did a video and I was like mom went to re- made my mom drive me to the Smithtown Mall to go to Record Town to buy the damn record and that's all I listened to for like months at a time and then right after that you talking about Smith Haven Mall Smith Haven Mall yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah we call it the mall because yeah. that's the all mall, that, was, that was our that was only that was option out there, out, you know it's a, a Smith big Haven, day out if we Town, got up yeah. to yeah yeah so, cool because that's, that's what just we right would around go. the corner yeah. from you yeah, yeah, it was right, a big yeah. day yeah. for us <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> I'm like holy shit we're going to the mall I think so so uh what's your dude man so huge that you know and then that Christmas I got a BB gun and New Day Rising and I put it in my yellow yeah I put it in my yellow Sony Walkman because yeah. I made enough money, you know, landscaping and mowing lawns, that I could have that baller. <laughs> you sprung uh, for the yellow. Yeah, I got that because I needed it. Waterproof, man. <laughs> Waterproof. Was it? Uh, and of course. I re- probably had that flip. Yep. yep. And I remember listening to that record and shooting cans in my backyard, and that was like, changed my life. Nice. Um, so then two, is not a, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody who knows me well enough, Chromags, Chromags Age of Coral. Uh, I was, I think it was 88 or 89 um, you know, I was just starting to get into punk and hardcore and we're watching again, 120 minutes, me and my sister staying up late on Sunday night, how Which she they was still get, they still show those now on, yeah. on VH1 classics and mm-hmm. every now and then, yeah, it's all, but some, without the host, no, well, the without, the, without the host, right? yeah, yeah, but that's half the fun. No, I know, but still, like sometimes, like I'll like I'll go home now. It'll probably be on VH1 Classics, and I'll just watch like thirty minutes. Of it was it. the best I, show. It was life changing. You know that guy I was talking about the horror convention, Stumpy or whatever the fuck yeah, his name yeah. was that sells all that weird shit. Yeah. They bought twenty five discs of hundred twenty minutes episodes with the That's host awesome. and everything. Oh, That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. So you know we're watching it. We're waiting for like the Smiths video to come on, <laughs> and there's this segment about this movie called The Beat. And they show this live footage of this band and it's dudes in camo shorts and shaved heads smashing into each other and going nuts. And I just remember (laughs) in seventh grade and I'm like, this is what I've been looking for my entire life. And my sister's like, I'm not buying you that record. And I'm like, no, you're buying me that record. She's like, I'm not buying you that record. You're not getting my discount. I'm not letting you buy that record. And I'm like, yeah. I'm, we're going tomorrow. And you're Boy, we're discount buying that record. big, yeah. yeah huge. <laughs> what do we get, 20%? 20%. Boom. And I, I can't remember if I got it at Record World or I got it at Record Town. Not really sure. A whole, you know, Every skateboard after that had the lyrics written on it. Um, I mean, life-changing and still the hardcore record, though I've grown to enjoy the demo more. Um, still to this day, man, you put age of, and it, my wife puts it on all the time. So all of a sudden she'll be doing, you know, she'll be in the kitchen cooking and yeah. all of a sudden click, click, click. And it's like, she ever, I want to, does she ever break a plate? Like, sometimes. <laughs> um, and I just want to like pick one of my kids up, from, <laughs> you know, and, and it's still, it's, you know, the lyrics, the story behind the band, you know, even all the drama that happens now, it's still to me, it all is like the perfect story. Um, and you know, that record is just, it's changed so many people's lives, but it just, it's just incredible. I mean, it's just an incredible If I'm going to read a book, which one am I reading? I'm not going to say on the podcast. I'm not going to say record. I would read both. Okay. I would read both. I would do uh, John Joseph's first, and then I would do Harley's after, okay. but both books are well, well worth reading. Nice. So then one is the Smith. Number one. Number one is the Smiths. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I... I knew I liked this guy. Um, I told you. Wide palette. I, let Man me tell you, here. there are pictures of me like in sixth and seventh grade. And, you know, my sister helped me out with the stupid pompadour. <laughs> and, you know, the the glasses, the dark, you know, the dark rim glasses and the jean jacket. And I read Oscar Wilde. And, uh, oh, wow. Yeah, I was, Cemetery you know, I, I was a little kid. Yeah. Just that was my that was my jam. And still, again, I listen to it What's on the way down. favorite album? Do you have one? That's really hard. And I actually say Louder Than Bombs, even though technically it's not the album. Um, it's, but that, I remember buying that in a mall in Rhode Island while we were picking out my sister's prom dress that while she was looking at colleges. 30 years old. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's going to be on, we have Louder Than Bombs and, uh, Strange Ways. Strange yep. Ways. Same, Strange yeah. Ways is a great record you know too. The Queen is Dead is It's my hard favorite. to pick, the Queen is Dead is for me also. Cemetery Actually, Meet is Murder is probably my Meet favorite. Meet Murder is a great but, record. But, uh, 
like in reading their books too. I didn't read the Morrissey book, but uh, I read the uh, was it Tony Martin? There's a light that never goes out, which is was was very interesting. And uh, you know, they were such they wanted to be a singles band. Yeah, you know what I mean. And that was Morrissey idolized all those uh, girl groups and those those sixties pop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, you don't even get the feeling like they were making records that like you know they wanted singles and stuff yeah. like that and the records kind of so that's why it's you can't go wrong picking any of their those fucking albums. lyrics though oh, yeah. so so i think good. he's the best lyricist i've ever so heard good. in my life and i'm you know okay i didn't yeah. learn to appreciate yeah. it till i got older but johnny Me too. johnny mars guitar player brilliant is some of the most incredible it's modern so guitar player man. i mean it's like stuff like it, yeah, i remember when i first started playing acoustic guitar and i'm like oh, i'll learn some smith songs no and i'm like Oh shit, no! Like no. I'm not ever gonna be able to play no. this. Maybe I can learn the bass part. There's something about like that. I remember trying to learn also a Descendants stuff. Yeah, like way more intricate than it lets on. But um, like Johnny Marr and like Peter Buck have like a similar style. Like, oh they yeah, just yeah. do these like crazy single picking notes, and they're just like all over the place. Mm. Amazing stuff. So yeah. awesome. That's a great list. Yeah. Solid. Thank and, you. Uh, that is the. The, the the story of uh, Scott from Trip Face. Yeah. Um, so what are we gonna do? I guess we're gonna do our top five, which we always do with our guests, which is the uh, top five. Uh, what are we doing? Dystopian films. Dystopian films. Yes. Okay. Cool. Scott came up with the idea, which I appreciate because it's something we never got to talk to about here. It's a good genre. I think so too. Um. So before we do that, um, I'm just going to talk about the, the list that we've been doing on, on Facebook and the Facebook group. Yes. Also, what I forgot to mention was Pete Tadone from the podcast The Film Basement um, told me that it would be a cool idea if we had like a accompanying uh, playlist mm-hmm. on Spotify since we all like Spotify so much. So anything that we talk about in this episode, I'm going to make a, a playlist out of. So this is episode 16. Yeah. So look out for episode 16. We're going to do a lot of trip face and, and we're going to go through uh, Scott's top 10. So a- anything that we talk about as far as like music, we're just yeah. going to make a playlist and I got to figure out what we're going to do as far as like movies. Like maybe we could do like a YouTube channel and just oh, yeah, put up links idea. to. Yeah. Um, and also, we've been uh, doing some polls. So 30 years ago was 1987, so I figured it'd be cool to um, talk about 20 of the best records that came out in 1987, as well as 20 of everyone's favorite uh, movies that came I out. i come to realize how loaded that year was. Loaded. Loaded. For 30 years. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a little tournament. So we're going to just keep throwing them up on there, and yes. somewhere along the end of the year, we're going to find out what everyone's favorite album and uh, favorite movie we're of gonna 1987. We're going to do like a bracket tournament? Yeah. I, I mean, I have no idea what we're doing. We're just throwing <laughs> it up there, so... You know, I like I have an idea. I just I'm 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 a better idea person than I am executing in it because, you know, I have a fucking life. You know, I feel you can't fucking live and breathe this fucking stupid podcast. <laughs> so um, you want to kick off your number five? Uh, let, let's let our guests. Oh, the guest. Yeah. Sure. We'll do They're round. Guests. We each pick you do five and we go around, do we'll all our around. fives and awesome. et cetera. So uh, <clears throat> my first my first is Omega Man. Okay. Which is yes. actually just out of curiosity, what, what made you pick this? And this has been, you know, and it goes back to again, hardcore and comic books. I I'm a child of the '80s. When I was like eight or nine, we thought the world was ending <laughs> any day, yeah. any day. And now. Grumman yeah. was like, Grumman was three miles down the road. So every day we were in the backyard, pretending to be fighting Russians and getting air support from A6s and F14s. Yeah. So, Red you know, dawn. I, the fact that I am, for, you know, 41 and alive with kids yeah. is real weird because I didn't think yeah. we'd Wasn't be here part today. of the plan. Wasn't part of the Wasn't plan. Part of the I remember plan. seeing the day after when they put that on TV. Yeah. I was like, yeah. well, that's that. Yep. Threads. Any day now. Threads, oh, I got man, dude. I hear that. that was brilliant. A, that yeah. was on YouTube for a while, but I think it might have gotten taken down. It's a UK film. Yeah, it's, it's on, a, it's on it's the a, fire stick. It's, okay. a B, it's a BBC uh, miniseries that will churn your stomach, Yeah. but is fantastic, and it's about England after a nuclear exchange. Yes. Oh, boy. I got to check 84, that out. 84, I think. Yeah. Maybe My mom let me watch that, yeah. but not married with children. <laughs> it, it, it was it was like a movie, right? It, wasn't it was like, like a movie, okay. but it was a BBC like cuz I'll I'll always bring up the movie Miracle Mile. That was one of those movies that was like nuclear bomb. Yeah. Mm. That was 1988, Anthony Edwards. 
uh, that movie scared the shit out of me. I was ten, and it, any like after watching that, I was like, "All right, we're gonna die any minute." <laughs> if you want to get really depressed, watch the movie Testament, <laughs> which is another post nuclear, but it's not. You know, there's, it's a little, it's grueling. It's about a, a woman surviving with children, like mm. in Northern California, and it's horrid. I made my wife watch it, and she's like, "If you, she's like, if you ever make me watch that movie ever <laughs> again, I will stab you in your sleep," um, and. Terrible movie, but not on my list. Okay. Go back to Omega Man, though. What do you, what do you... Heston is, you know, yeah, you know, hilarious, and it's campy. Um, I Am Legend isn't a bad movie, but you know, I I feel like this one gets I lost. I think it gets lost because they remade it. And, that uh, CGI in I Am Legend is the worst CGI in film history, in my I, opinion. And I think it did a really for me. You know, my big fear with probably came from Twilight Zone episodes was. What if I survive the end of the world and I'm the only one? And that kind of ties into that and ties into that mindset. Right. So Twilight I just Zone was good at that. Yeah. So I think it's, it's Heston was balling though. He had a yeah. nice little apartment yeah. and shit. Yeah. They had those freaky <laughs> talking to mannequins. What about like the yeah. hippie yeah. subtext? There was a little film. bit of hippie subtext, but I could Where'd handle that. That? that came at seventy one. Yeah. Because yeah. although they, they were like, Zon- did you see the film? He's got it in the O <laughs> section. Yeah. Oh shit. But yeah. Double it up, number three. They're like zombie hippies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's fighting so. Mr. America. But yeah, that's a great choice. Right. Uh, Good pick, Parker. I don't even five. know if my number five fucking counts. Me neither. I don't I, know. I'm like, so. Did you look at it? Did you see what no, I No, no, I'm just talking about Because I had the fucking general. Google with dystopian even men. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Oh, I kind of knew what it was, uh, but like, I wasn't sure. I'm going to go for it. You ready? Yeah. Tim Burton's Batman. Does that count? It, it kind of does. Okay. I get, there, there is a, a among, like a futuristic um, kind of among yeah. nerdy dystopian people that yeah. actually comes okay. up for a lot Still of. Still my favorite Batman. Movie. Yes. Uh, saw it in the theater five times. Love the music. <laughs> Prince Danny Elfman. Uh, Shout out to Jen Elfman. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jack Nicholson. Still my favorite Joker. Yeah. You know, out of everything. Agreed. Um, I loved the production, Anton first, and uh, believe it or not, I actually even liked the second one. I didn't mind the second one. I liked the second yeah. one. Yeah, the second one was good. Was I think Mr. Yeah. Freeze? No. No, that, that was like the that fourth. That was Danny or... DeVito as the yeah. Penguin, yeah. Michelle Pfeiffer, yep. Catwoman, come yeah. on now, Christopher Walken, yep. that motherfucker. Yeah. 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 I agree. I think Mr. Freeze was four. Yeah. The only movie that I ever walked out on. I saw it. Oh, it's pretty, it's pretty what's, terrible. What's the big movie theater on the way to Riverhead that... Island 16. The islands. I saw it on Island yeah. 16, and we had to sit in the front row, and I was miserable. Uh, but it was row. probably Brookhaven Multiplex by, back, back oh, then. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was Exit 64. Yeah. yeah. So, um, for me, I have uh, number five. I, I, I don't really know if, if um, you know, it's necessarily the best of the three, but it's the one that I remember the most because I watched it as a kid, and it's Mad Max... <laughs> Beyond Thunderdome. Great movies. I love that. Great movies, movies man. Tina and Turner. Like I, I was. It that was the first. Don't, need, don't need another hero, man. <laughs> it was. The, it was the first one that I saw because I think it was 1985. So I was seven, and I saw it in the theaters, and I didn't know that there was two other movies. Right. Um, but the characters are super strong. The setting. Yeah. Uh, Mel Gibson fighting that dude with the metal fucking shit on. Asta Blaster, man. Yeah. Who runs Border Town, yeah. son? Asta Blaster. <laughs> Did you actually watch the... Uh, people loved the remake. I didn't watch it. I didn't see it. Fury Road? I thought it was okay, but I only watched it like one or two times. I, don't I heard it's it. good. Yeah, I heard it was good. I just... I just haven't got around to it. I just didn't want to yeah. watch it. But people said they loved it. But uh, uh, yeah, seeing that in the theater and and uh, the characters. The characters are great. The, the, the fucking kid that didn't talk was painted in white. Oh, yeah. um, you remember him, like the then the the, yeah. the the pilot with the little kid, who was in Road Warrior too, was he? Yeah. Oh yeah, you're right. Yep. So definitely, Mad Max uh, Beyond Thunderdome is my number five. That was the Mad Maxes were on my original list, and I was trying to figure out which one of the three, and they got pushed off. But that huge influence on everybody, yeah, who well, was young then, you yeah. know, cars, death, destruction, yeah. desert. Yeah. Australia. There was like an '80s thing with Australia too. Everybody loved Australia in the '80s. Yes, Crocodile Dundee. Yep, that's right. <laughs> BMX Bandits. Yo, yeah. Oh, yeah. what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we just became Crocodile. best friends. <laughs> Crocodile Dundee. Fuck that, guys! Just said BMX Bandits, man. <laughs> Nicole Kidman's first movie. Yeah. What's up? Oh, she was. 
I was I was in love. Goose PJ Patapuff. Yeah. <laughs> Langan, number five. Uh, my number five is an oldie. I wasn't born when this came out, so you can not joke. Fucking about shit's got to be fucking old. Metropolis, <laughs> 1927. Fritz Lang. Um, it's obviously ahead of its time. It actually it cost so much when they made it. I read that it bankrupted the studio at the time, and nobody <laughs> liked it. I guess it didn't go over well, but. The set design, I, I love all the German expressionistic stuff from Nosferatu, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and whatever, and it's one of the most amazing looking films for its time. I mean, uh, it's basically, you know, a, a society where there's these big towers where rich people live and these lower levels where all the poor people live and run the machines and the, it's a class struggle and stuff. A lot of stuff ahead of its time, but it's it's one of the most amazing looking films ever. And when you consider the time it was made, forget it. So, Metropolis. Metropolis, number five. All right, back to Scott. What's your number four? So, my number four is a movie that is not popular with a lot of people, but I'm a big fan of it. I've watched it a million times. Is it a um, Fritz Lang movie? And no. <laughs> it's it's The Postman. <laughs> and yeah, I know. I've already got a Kevin Costner movie. <laughs> oh, really? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've I never love seen that it. movie. I've I don't think seen I saw it. I love that oh, movie. I it's also that. a movie that is different from the book, but the book and the movie are just as good. Both are really fantastic. Um, I think I like it so much because I also like alternative history and it's such kind of almost a civil war piece. And there's a lot of, um, there, there's a lot of nodding to the 1800s. And so I kind of like that having that decay of post collapse world. And then on top of it, almost like history reliving itself. Is that what you mean when you say like alternative history? Yeah, well, I like I like a lot of alter, a lot of alternative history. Strangely enough, is written about the Civil War. Actually, the people who are producing Game of Thrones, their next show is going to be oh, that's uh, right, yeah. a Confederacy won the war. Um, there was a film that I, don't, I can't remember the name of it, uh, and that was the the premise of it. It was it looked like a documentary, but what if the South yeah, won what the if war? The South won. So a, even yeah. like Inglorious Bastards had yeah, that. yeah, yeah. You know, and so my one of my undergraduate degrees is history. And at some point in my life, I will be a history teacher. Um, and so it kind of ties into my love for science fiction into history, which I always enjoyed. So I've watched that movie a thousand times and everybody thinks I'm crazy. Um, I think people give Kevin Costner a bad rap. Um, and I think he's actually pretty good in this movie. I like yeah. him. I like his stuff yeah. a lot. So, um, okay. Parker, number four. So once again, I don't even know if this counts, but we're going to go for it. <laughs> Last man on earth. Uh, the Vincent Price? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, why okay. not? Well, that's also... Yeah. Yeah, Omega Man. Yep, Omega yeah. Man, that... That movie's been... You know, kind of equals times. I Am yeah, Legend, Legend, and then, which we totally fucking forgot to talk about, was the passing of George Romero. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're we're going to... Because both uh, of those kind of... We're going to have a whole episode. Because yeah, both yeah, of those kind of went into, yeah. you know, influence Night of the Living Dead. But, uh... We're going to talk about it uh, October 20th. Nice. <laughs> But uh, the whole uh, whole basis on that, well, number one, it's black and white, which I love. I love Vincent Price. Um, plague kills everyone, and there's like the vampires attack him every night. Um, and pretty much his only friends are mannequins, same as uh, yeah. same as Omega Man. But I love that one. Oh, that was it. That was a great yeah. version. Yeah. Um, the, the funny part about it that I love is Vincent Price, like really effeminately, like swinging shit at yeah. these guys because he had this like <laughs> yeah he wasn't some kind of powerhouse yeah. but if you well, then, watch it again and then the, like, the, uh, get out the one vampire that like yells at him every night <laughs> yeah. he's like morgan come out you know it's like he only had like one friend that was a vampire yeah, that, so. one, that, that movie's good shit uh, absolutely so. okay um my number four is a newer movie and uh it kind of blew me away when i watched it because just the direction, the colors, the simplicity in the characters, but it, it it definitely still had that Mad Max influence, in my opinion, anyway. So number four is Turbo Kid. Yo, good uh, one. Yeah. Fucking good choice. Um, Love just that movie. the description, I'll just read it because it'll do better than I can. It's in a post apocalyptic wasteland, an orphan teen must battle a ruthless warlord, played by Michael fucking Ironside. Another movie that he loses. Oh no, he loses to a hand save only. the girl of his dreams. Killer soundtrack. And he rides a BMX bike. Yeah, you saw that, right? Yeah. You saw that, right? Yeah. So fucking How good. How great is that? It's a good movie. Yeah. It, like really blew great me soundtrack. Away. He oh, had he had a Walkman. Like just everything about it, just like everything that they were going for, I felt like it really connected. That was Australian New Zealand. Was it? That movie? I it was yeah. Canadian. 
No, Australia, New Zealand, that is. Uh, I think I'm moving. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, man. <laughs> so uh, I'm pretty sure it's on Netflix, and it's a newer movie. So if you're listening. Or you can come over and just borrow it. Yeah, just come over. It's in the T-section. We'll move the drum set you over. You can find it. <laughs> so, number four, Turbo Kid. Uh, Langan, number... What do you... I don't remember. Number I'm four? At... Oh, yeah, you. Yeah. I'm at number four? Yeah. I'm going to go with uh, number four, The Running Man. Nice. Great movie. Um, I'm glad I left it out because someone was going to mention it. and that's. I have all these alternates. I always do that because I try to jump in my alternates. But uh, I love that the first time I saw it, it's a great combination of just being a straight-up action flick. But then, you know, if you go below the surface, it's almost like practically where we're heading into television maybe 10 <gasps> years from now. Where somebody runs around and someone I th- tries. I think we're close. We're close. I, I think we're very close. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I think 10 is being a little bit. Uh... It, it, it's a shame that Richard Dawson isn't here to host yeah. it because I thought he'd be excellent. But uh, The Butcher of Baker. I mean, all the villains are so colorful and, and you know, it, it, it's got it's it's a big statement about society, but it works as just a plain old action film and you, based on a short story by Stephen King yep. too. Oh really? Yep. I didn't know that. Yes, yeah. I didn't know that at all. I didn't yeah. read it, but Yo, he, that guy must write like all the time. Even when he's shitting, yeah. drink, <laughs> like everything like riding a bike, he must be riding <laughs> shit like I mean, unbelievable. He's so prolific. It's unbelievable. ridiculous. Cocaine does hell of a lot. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Shout out to Cocaine. Nice. <laughs> Shout out to his dealer. <laughs> Can't be easy to be a dealer in Maine. <laughs> he, 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 yeah. Stephen King's your guy, though, man. He's probably right lives right. like right. He probably has a room in his house. <laughs> Are you in your room? He's like his hey, Cato Kalen. He lives in like the, <laughs> the shed in the back. He's got a, he's got a boat plane. <laughs> I um, never thought we'd get to Stephen King's cocaine dealer in the show, but I'm glad we <laughs> mentioned him. Yeah, I'm glad we got to him eventually. I knew you got to invite a librarian. I'm sure. Yeah, right. <laughs> By episode 16, I figured we'd hit it. Um, <laughs> What I used to do that was super fucking geeky and nerdy as as a as a little moron watching the <laughs> Running Man. <laughs> um, I remember Maria Conchita Alonso. Oh, Shout yeah, out yeah, to yeah. her. Uh, mm, you fine. Know yeah, yeah. Uh, fine. <laughs> it's a fine girl, right fine there. Lady. Um, she like I guess they were in that scene and they were like memorizing these numbers. And it was oh, like yeah. 24, 8, six, like whatever it was. I remembered all those numbers for like 10 years after watching That's it. That's been his bank pin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> nice. So I don't know why, but like I would just like remember those numbers. And every time I would get to that or I'd like I'd recite it, I would say that or I would say like Miles Bennett Dyson. Those were the two things that I would remember the most. Wow. Yeah. I remember like six months after that I came over, they had the those things on the neck or whatever that they had to get yeah. the coat off or whatever. And like. HBO released that shitty uh, HBO movie, Dead, De- De- Dead Deadlock, Lock? Yeah. with Rucka Howard, baby. Shout yeah. out to Rutger yeah. Howard. Love me some Rucka. What was Jesse Ventura's name in that? He was Captain... Was Captain, Captain Le- Freedom. Freedom. Yeah. That was it. Very fitting. Uh, yeah. yeah, totally. So. Totally. All right, Scott, number three. So yes. number three um, is a comic book movie, mm. um, and uh, one of my favorite comic books ever written. Uh, as much as kind of the Smiths and the Cro-Mags influenced my life, Alan Moore was huge a huge part of my youth a huge part of um kind of shaping me in the future and i thought v for vendetta is probably the best transition from a comic book to a movie v for vendetta was uh alan moore's one of his first comics it was re-released by dc comics after watchmen became so popular um, it's not my number one because it was really clear to me at like the age of 12 and most fans of the comic that v V's gender was either um, non-binary or he was gay, and that's why he was put in a concentration camp in the story, in the comic book story. And the only part that they fucked up in the movie, and I was so mad when I saw it, was the fact that they made him uh, a romantic interest with Evie. Um, because I thought that was really powerful in the 80s, not to talk, not just to talk about fascism during Thatcher and Reagan, mm-hmm. but also to have one of the first really, you know gay superheroes right um and that's where i thought they really kind of screwed up but i thought the movie transitioned really well and up until that scene i was super into it and i still watch it all the time i've been a little more forgiving over time about it but uh the scenery looks fantastic i was really wasn't sure that they could pull off v and they pulled it off perfectly nice i haven't seen that flick i gotta it's good gotta man. check it out yeah that's the one with the that girl right? from yes. strong island yeah, Plainview, right? Yeah, Plainview. Uh, 
Is she really? Yeah. Portman. What's her name? Natalie Portman. Natalie, Natalie Portman. Portman. Yeah. That's right. Um, Parker. I got three. I got a double, so I did uh, Omega Man as well. And uh, I don't know, Charlton Heston, I was always a big Planet of the Apes fan. Um, the Anth- uh, Anthony Zerbe, I think is the actor's name, that plays, uh, what is that, Matthias? Yeah, and... Yeah, he's in one of my favorite horrible movies, man. Kiss meets the Phantom. <laughs> uh, Kiss meets the Phantom. Really? So, <laughs> yeah, love it. And uh, these are crazy nights, man. Yeah. That's, oh my god, what a shitty fucking album. Um, <laughs> and there was a couple of Millhouse quotes from that too, which I loved. So, from Sunny in the Milk. So, that's a good one. I like that movie. Nice. Kill it. All right, uh, my number three is John Carpenter, Escape from New York. Yeah. Oh, nice. Man. I watched the shit out of this movie when it came out, um, and it just is one of those movies that I lapped again. What's Damn. up? Damn, it's my number two. Oh, it's your number two. Fuck. Um, the alternates up in there. I yeah, know, three year olds. So uh, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, we're gonna have the same. List. I'll go with L.A. Don't worry. That whole surfing <laughs> scene. <laughs> that whole <laughs> surfing scene. Don't worry. All right, so then I'll, I'll, I'll let you speak on it, but uh, I, I loved it. What an iconic. Movie character too man yes yeah, snake i mean yes. anything aside from captain ron i can't think of anything that <laughs> that kurt russell's been in that's been terrible you know he's no it's true yeah, it's true his resume he's is solid. thick as fuck yeah you know so true. Uh, yeah that's my number three I'll, I'll let parker shout out to overboard too yeah, great movie of course Summer. shout out to goldie hawn when she still looked like goldie hawn ah. yeah i guess we all age we do you know just hanging in there. Yeah. <laughs> still, still, still looks good. So, what's your number three? Uh, my number three is uh, Brazil. It's a great movie. Uh, Terry Gilliam. Terry Gilliam, who really, I mean, is one of the most unique directors, I think, in the history of film as far as his looks from Time Bandits to uh, to this film, the Baron von Munchad, or whatever he does. Um. But the story, the uh, you know, the authoritarian culture, it's uh, automation, totalitarianism, and uh, such a uh, claustrophobic, repressive society. And this guy with these dreams of escape from that and stuff. And De Niro is like the uh, what was it, the air conditioner? Like the, he works in the vents and stuff like that. But uh, the visuals in it are amazing. It's got a lot of you know. Uh, it's it's sci-fi, but there's a lot of humor in it too, which is something that he pulls off very well. And uh, one of those like uh, legendary covers, too. Yes, you know the actual like going through the mom and pop shops. Oh yeah, like that you would see. You're like, what that's the fuck where is I this? got it from. Was yeah, you the, like, what is this Brazil movie? Yeah, yeah. yes. Cool. So. Uh, back to our guest, Scott. Number what are we up to? Two. Number two uh, is Blade Runner. Mm. Um, it's one of my favorite movies. Uh, I'll do it with voiceover and without voiceover. Rick Deckard is a name I use at every restaurant whenever they're going to call me for my table. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, shout out to John Torn. Uh, him and I nerd out about this movie all the time. You know, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, mm. um, but I also love everything, every movie this man's in. Yeah. Um, and this was such kind of a removal from what he would normally play and just the question i'm also a huge philip k dick fan and do androids dream of electric sleep is one of the best science fiction books ever written so and again this book another book as good uh, or movie as good as the book and a little different but you know for me as a kid it, that question of who i am what's the meaning of life this really spoke to it because the whole time you're like who's an android who's yeah. not an android mm-hmm. if you're an android and you're you're a robot are you a sentient being you know, just a lot of, I think a lot of questions people have at a certain age, and I think it really kind of got into my psyche. Yeah. Visually, too. Uh, like incredible. Like insane. Especially back then, it was like 82. Yeah. Rutger Hauer again, yep. Daryl yeah. Hannah. The score to that film by incredible. Vangelis is one of my top five favorite yeah, I, film scores ever. It was, we, we had it on VHS cassette back when like having a vhs was like a big deal oh, like yeah. you're like holy shit like we you were like, some shit remember, in the neighborhood <laughs> when you had that <laughs> <laughs> remember because like every movie was like 79.99 and shit like oh, that oh buy like, it yeah, yeah. Just fucking buy I that know. motherfucker no. it was like a lot if of you money. lost that shit in yeah. a video oh, store they'd bang you out like a hundred dollars imagine man. like 80 people were spending like 80 like um like if you had um the tv guide 
the TV guy had had like all like that stuff. So it's like the laser discs and all that other stuff. Uh-huh. And you'd see VHS, and it was newer ones were one hundred twenty nine dollars. <laughs> And then everything like else was like seventy nine or eighty nine, yeah. and goddamn, times have changed. Yeah, right. <laughs> Imagine that you still had to rewind shit. You you dropped ninety dollars and you still rewind. Still shit. had to rewind it. Fuck. Shout what out to Laserdisc. What was the video store that was across the parking lot from Record World that you also bought tickets for shows at? Oh, oh I missed buying tickets for shows. Oh there. yeah. It was in the front where they yeah. put that blimpies and shit. Yeah, eventually. yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a ticket master in there. Oh, damn it, man. It's going to drive me nuts now. Yeah, you used to like blimpies. wait online for to the store tickets. to open to buy. I remember oh, Metallica Lollapalooza. tickets. I was getting loud Palooza. I got <laughs> yeah. that at EJ's Tobacco and Ridge. Yeah, place. I went. Yeah. I, I bought tickets for the Beastie Boys at EJ's Tobacco. Yeah, man. Yep. Because you could go to Taco Bell and get tickets. You know, Parker's the, only, Bell you know Parker's the only person who hates the Beastie Boys? No, my wife upstairs doesn't. All right, this t- I'm not a huge. Really. I'm not yeah. a huge Beastie Boys guy. Really? <laughs> not really. Sorry? I mean, I think it was by default because you we listen. We listen. Jesus. We like, well, the thought, guy watches BMX Bandits, bro. Yeah, he doesn't yeah, maybe, maybe we were in parking and lots and together with it on. I didn't say I hated the Beastie Boys. No, I didn't say I hated the Beastie Boys. It was just, you know, wasn't. I saw him with Rollins Band, and Rollins Band blew them out of the water. Yeah. Saw him with fire hose and fire hose blew him out of the water. So, I always get fire hose and firehouse. Yeah, who the hell, who's fire hose? I don't even know. Fire hose Mike was, Watt. Uh, Mike Watt from uh, Minutemen. <laughs> you oh. get fire hose. <laughs> Let me ask you too. Back to Blade Runner. You seen the director's cut and the other one, the, the alternative endings and stuff. What do you like better? I never saw that. Um, I had to watch it in film school. We had to like write a paper on it. It made us watch everything. You know, I don't know. I the, the, the director's cut with the voiceover is probably the one I watched the most. Mm. And I'm trying to remember what the ending is on that one. Because I, I think Ridley Scott was like adamant that he loved it. Obviously, they always loved the director's, director's cut. Yeah. His director cut, director's cuts are always better. Yeah. I'm waiting for him to do Prometheus. They're both good. Don't he did, he directed Prometheus, right? I don't like know. Prometheus. I didn't so see I. it. Yeah, that's Ridley Scott. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I feel like that movie will be good when he does. When he does. My what? I, I didn't watch Covenant. Aren't they but did you like Covenant? Uh, I did. I I don't have a choice to not it. like Alien. Okay. Am uh, I wrong? Shout out to Lindsay Runner? Knockout again. Uh, <laughs> huge a- Aliens Predator fan, and I've watched those movies more times than I can count. I haven't seen those. Uh, They're redoing but, Blade Runner, aren't they? Yeah, they are, and it looks okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm okay with it. I, yeah, I was gonna I'm ask. okay with it. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I just want to get like, cause to you don't want to miss a gem of this. Yeah. I'm back and I want to get all here. your voices. So <laughs> yes, I'm when sorry. I compress later. Yes, it doesn't sound like me. I'm just talking <laughs> to myself. <laughs> um, okay, number two, Parker. Yeah. Number two, what a surprise! Escape from New York. Boom. Yeah, sounds like uh-huh. we just talked about that movie. Now, did you ever see the director's cut of that? I didn't. That's pretty good. That's got like a, I think it's like a 15 minute um, alternate opening. Because it's the movie's kind of weird. It just starts and Snake Plin- Plissken's getting off of a bus and he's arrested. But this director's cut actually shows you what he did, how he got arrested, how the guy he was going to rob the bank with actually kind of fucked him over and gave him to oh. the cops and blah blah blah. Oh, I like haven't that. seen that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah, in like the, that. the east section up there. You, you could just fucking take like thirty-seven movies home. It's got. Them, it's got to be really <laughs> weird to like act with an eye patch. You know. Yeah. Not when you're Kurt Russell. No. <laughs> You think he meant method and just wore yeah. it all the time? I, I think one thing that's lost Call on me Snake. lost on people with that movie is the fact that at the time the movie was made, New York City wasn't that different. No. Oh, you know, yeah. I mean it was you know, you're you're it was it eighty one maybe? Yeah. And I mean I think for anyone who saw that movie when New York was still that way, yeah. it speaks you know, I hear a lot of people like, Oh god, it's so campy. It's like yeah, no, to this not day, uh, to this day, and and like you know, the, my older relatives, that's the recollection they have. So anytime I tell them we're playing in Williamsburg, they're oh, thinking yeah. like, "What?" what? And I'm like, "No, no, it's way different. It's yeah. not like it was 30 years ago." And like the Bronx was like the worst place on the planet. Yeah. Like my lying. friends live in Bushwick. Like they yeah. live in Bush. They like, live there. And for like 10 years, they've lived in Bushwick, yeah. and it's still. I go to their house sometimes, and like, this changed. is the weirdest thing ever. Yeah, but you know they love it. What was the time Shout frame out to they? Uh, <laughs> Bushwick. Bill. What was the time frame they set that movie in? You know how they always say New York twenty whatever. Yeah, oh, it was shit. every movie it was probably was already passed. I think, passed, we, I think right? we passed. We it passed. Already. Yeah, yeah, right? it's like we passed most of them. Twenty ten. We're still here. So, um, but uh, Isaac Hayes too. Yeah. 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 The car. Duke of New York. Donald you know, Pleasant. Ernest Board Nine with the right? tax uh, cabbie. You know. 
Adriana Barbal, one of my first crushes. Uh, yeah. I feel like oh, John so. Carpenter got his dues way after every one of his movies. Yeah. John Carpenter is by far my favorite horror director. I think so. He's so, he's the best. It's a national treasure. You know, between directing and you know the uh, the soundtracks. Yeah, oh yeah. Got us some shitty around. facial hair. Though. The thing. Yeah. The thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. And that's a great. Yep. That's and that gets lumped into dystopian. I yes. don't know if it is. Yes. But, oh really? Oh. Wow. Also, I Kurt Russell. I could watch that movie a million Another times. Another Kurt Russell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So top uh, five Kurt Russell movies. Oh. Fuck, bro, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, we down. actually could do that. <laughs> that's a tough it's one. It's coming up. <laughs> I mean, we're all going to pick the thing, but we uh, can do yeah, that. That's true. So, um, all right, so my number two is uh, I'm pretty sure this counts. And if it doesn't, I don't give a shit because, you know, it's just what it is. I, I, did, se- I, I did seven inches when I was supposed to do I hope albums, it ain't my number so one. I, I like that. <laughs> I fucking hope it ain't my number one. <laughs> number two is Class of Newcomb High. Oh, good one. Yeah. That's a Class great fucking Newcomb movie. Class of Newcomb High, uh, Troma. Uh, I've seen this movie like a hundred times, and it's just... Uh, I love it. It's just these kids, and there's like radioactive <laughs> shit, and like somehow it spreads, and all these people turn into cretins, and it's it's just... Troma created this universe for for this school in the setting that was just the scariest thing ever. You know, you didn't want to go to school at at uh, at this high school, and uh, it just had the best of like gore and like comedy and uh, that theme song, everything you want. New come yeah. high, what's <laughs> going on? <laughs> you know, I just looked at this list real quick, and I'm very you know sad to say that only one Kurt Russell movie got released in 1987, <laughs> and that was Overboard. So at least it was a good one. Yeah. Was it only one? Yeah, I mean, but then, of course it was a good one. Nah. So. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Class of Newcomb High. Uh, avoid the. I feel like a lot of people are still like. There's probably like a pocket full of people that haven't seen Class of Newcomb High. Avoid the sequels because they're the biggest pieces of shit oh they're yes. horrible they're that terrible. fucking that but third one is horrible that's trauma really i didn't mind return Summed though up. did you see return oh return was great i saw yeah. it in the theaters yeah. i mean toxic avenger home run and then what came after yeah, well I mean, one and four were great yeah two and three were terrible it took you know two shitty ones in the middle there that's you always got to watch the uh, sequels with uh, mr shout kaufman shout out um yeah number two class of newcomb high so now Oh no, you're number two. I'm number two. I can't two. count today. That's all right. That's all right. That's what we're here for. <laughs> I think we need like a chalkboard, <laughs> dry erase board, you know, a or, clicker. Nice. Or like Vanna White. Sweet. <laughs> What's she doing? <laughs> all right, my number two. Uh, I was on the fence because I, I I wanted to get a Cronenberg flick in there, um, between Videodrome or Existence. Uh, I picked Existence. Um, a lot of people didn't like this movie. I don't know if you guys have seen it. I don't know it. that. It's I um I, I know it. I just I know it, it and it's like on the it plays like on virtual reality where these uh you know, it's a typical body horror of Cronenberg where these video game systems like they they get plugged in into your body and you live in this alternate reality. Is it better than Lawnmower Man? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's not it's not like computerized Alter, virtual reality they go into like a whole nother world and they get trapped in these games eventually the games become part of their bodies again typical Cronenberg body horror but uh it was with Jude Law and I want to say Jennifer Jason Lee and I may have seen this in the I, theater I, it, yeah, you may have it, seen it in Mattatuck movie theaters bigger yeah shout out to Mattatuck movie theaters with the <laughs> sticky ass floors um <laughs> it's not one of his better known movies but I thought it was a gem in his catalog where everybody knows the video drum and history of violence and blah, 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 blah. You could go on and on. It's really good. And it's, again, it's got a lot of stuff in it, subtext about video games and almost with our phone cultures and how they're almost part of our bodies yeah. and electronics and uh, existence. And the it's spelled with a Z at the end. I like saw a that. Metal I ba- saw like a metal new, band. New metal do. band? Yeah. yeah no. Shout out to Chasta. Rest to in peace. Z. Yes. Uh, but uh, it's worth a watch if you didn't see it. Existence. Cool. Cronenberg. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I haven't seen it, but I've, I um, I always scroll past it wherever we're streaming stuff. Stop from. scrolling. Just snap <laughs> on it, my man. Just hit it. Press right? play. Just hit play, right? Don't think about it. Just let press go, play. Let go. Yeah. Come on, baby. Okay. <laughs> uh, so our guest is gonna give us. Are we up to number one yet? Number one. All right. So number <laughs> one is probably a surprise to some people. Uh, Children of Men. Oh. This is a movie I have watched a million times. Um, 
way better than the book. And, you know, it's, it's really? that's so, yeah, so much better than the book. Um, wow. I think, honestly, if there is a dystopian uh, science fiction film that predicts the future, I think this is the direction. Um, you know, and it's funny because The Handmaid's Tale, which I think is great. You know, also borrows from that. that oh, my wife loves that show. Yeah, my yeah. wife loves um, it. And you know, it's just the the domestic terrorism, the you know political intrigue, the you know everything about it scares me because it makes, especially now, you know, uh, makes me feel like this is the direction that the world goes in. And roughly, you know, what, what's the plot? It, it, it's basically it's a world where no one has had children. I think for eighteen years. Thank God. And. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and well, there's there's an issue with that when that Sounds happens. Sounds like what's the problem? Um, yeah. And then because of that, <laughs> like there's been world. there's been <laughs> some nuclear war in some parts of the world, and England has become kind of uh, this place where all these people have come to for safe harbor. And now you know the British, you know the natural born British want to push these people out, and it's um, so uh, I can't believe I'm not remembering his name right now. Clive uh, Owen. Clive Owen, who I could look at in any film. Yeah. Um, you know he has. It has the job. He's very miserable with life like everybody else. And he's shepherding this uh, young lady who's pregnant, who's also, I think, African-American or Carib- mm-hmm. You know, she's she's not British born. And he knows that if the British, you know, if the British fascist government gets a hold of her, you know, she's a science experiment. So she's trying to get him. She's trying to get her to this mysterious scientific group that lives on a boat. It's really bizarre, the whole idea of it. But and there's a lot of the co- there's some combat f- shots and it's on a steady cam and it's it's insane just tanks mm-hmm. shooting and it's the steady cam following them as, yeah. as they're running through this collapsing urban environment and it just like blows your mind it's intense yeah it and is bleak. It will give you an anxiety attack yes <laughs> um, and you know it's it's just so well done so well acted and really i think just gives a message about our possible future that I think is important for any science fiction film. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. I, you know, I've never seen it, so I should watch yeah, it. Me either. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's good. Who's the, and the I like female Clyde. lead? <laughs> She's someone else Shit. who I could, it's been a long time who I could watch in it. any movie. I'm a if red only hair. we had a device. Yeah. <laughs> if only we had a device that could find mm. these things out. So, uh, While I look that up, we'll, we'll have Parker <laughs> give his number one. Yes. Number one, I went with another carpenter, They Live. Yeah. Boom. Love it. Uh, I mean, everything from the frickin', you know, Rowdy Rowdy Piper, you know, Keith David, who, once again, we mentioned The Thing, loved him in The Thing, also love him in uh, Men at Work, that Garbage Man movie. That cracked, it's a great know. movie. Yeah. Um, we should hang out more. Yeah, right? <laughs> but uh, it's crazy. I mean, like, yes. the, you know, they, there's the one scene where, like, the uh, – well, like the homeless guy is considered, you know, selling out because he, you know, gave them over to like the aliens so he can move up in the world and he's wearing like a suit now and blah, blah, blah. But uh, just crazy as part, you know, as, as easy as a pair of putting a pair of sunglasses on. You can't freaking see Way this, ahead so. of its time. I yeah. mean, you Way say, be, you see memes or yeah. GIFs yeah. or, am I saying that right? Or is yeah. it a GIF? What are, I don't know what the fuck it is. We'll go with GIF. You know yeah. what the hell I'm talking about. And memes. About. Yeah. <laughs> no. But uh, the Obey thing. Oh, yeah. T-shirts, oh, yeah. Yep. hats. I've never seen it so much yep. than right now because, you know, marketing all the parallel with, the, with society the way it is right now, you know, it's very appropriate. Yeah. And very he honest. said, Carpenter said that it was like a complete fuck you to like Reagan. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which is what's it. One thing that's kind of sad is it's been adopted by the. Uh, more right wing people and people who kind of lean more right wing really as one of their films like and it's and I think that's why he's come out and said that because yeah. it's like oh because he's been saying it like I think he was on I want to say what the fuck WTF with yeah, Mark Maron with Mark Maron and and I think he definitely like made it a point and yeah just like, because yeah. it it's really among more right leaning because really? he was such a goddamn like, like he was real like 60s yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, and yeah. anyone who yeah. saw that in the 80s was like oh this is this is about this is a movie about classism yeah you know yeah. everybody knew it and like anything else for some reason in the last 10 years all of those films have kind of gotten turned around and the narrative has been kind of morphed in a way to fit that's crazy something. that they could think that like, the first I'm hearing it's like that. Fight Club yeah. <laughs> Fight Club same thing really yeah so like them saying obey is like fake news. 
yeah. obey. The media yeah. telling you to obey. You got it. Wow, I caught on. Cool. So I might be one in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> my number one. Before I do my number one, I, I actually wanted to shout out a couple here. Um, there's, uh, I thought I was going to throw wrist cutters in, but I guess that's kind of like afterlife. But still, I didn't see that wrist cutters. Yeah, I didn't that either. Oh, that's so good. Um, how, how it's uh, Shannon Sossman, um, and Patrick Fugit from Almost Famous, and in it like uh it's this place where people like let's say you kill yourself you end up going to this place and they they're all like suicide victims in the afterlife but it's like a whole different community and all this other stuff and it's just kind of like they're the world that they live in there so pretty interesting stuff um so i mean that was pushing it but still like they created like this universe and it was definitely weird highway to hell was another one but that's just because they're in hell. That was like 1990, and that's with Chad Lowe. Yeah, not, I have, the, I have not, the cover in my head right now. Chad not Rob Lowe, Lowe but yeah. Chad. Chad Lowe. <laughs> oh, and I, I feel like it was Christy Swanson too. She was nice. The original. Buffy. Chad Lowe got all his work when they were like, "All right, we get." I see Rob Lowe in this, but we can't get Rob Lowe. <laughs> Chad. Jimmy Chad. Is Chad available? <laughs> and uh, one more I want to mention: Snowpiercer. I, oh, I, okay. I didn't like it, and I don't know no. if I need to like re-list, like rewatch it. Why? I thought it was going to be right up my alley. I don't, I don't know what it was. It just I, I couldn't think it's stick the, with it. I think it's the one of the best movies I've seen over like the last ten years. Wow, interesting. Yeah. I, what's her name? Uh, who? Tilda Swinson Til, yeah. was so good in that movie. So good. But enough about that movie. My number one's Total Recall. Nice. Yeah. Like that's. Uh, could it be? My favorite Schwarzenegger movie, maybe, you know, between that and, cool. and, and T two, but like Total Recall, Hercules is goes bananas. My... <laughs> All right, close. <laughs> but once again, Michael Ironside, he's got two, yeah, f- two of my top five. Nice. Wow. You know, shout out. I feel like rewatching V right now. Might like, have to do top five like Yafet Koto movies, you know? <laughs> Talking about that guy, you know? <laughs> I think we were gonna pick all the same five, but uh, Total Recall, just the universe that was created. Um, was just so creative. Like everything, like you felt like I guess they were on Mars and uh, as a get kid. your ass to Mars. Oh, yeah. so good. <laughs> you know, like they they just I, I don't like the practical effects because that's all there was then. Um, the story Schwarzenegger was st- like he was at the peak at that point. I feel like 1990, like he could do no wrong. Like right before <laughs> Last Action Hero. <laughs> Which is a Which good I love movie. anyway. No, I know, but that still, movie for got some shitted reason. on, yeah. but it's not bad. Great soundtrack, yeah. too. Killer Alice in Chains. Right? Oh, what the hell, what the hell, what the hell have I? Yeah. I can still play it. That off beat ride. Is that your warm up lick? <laughs> it might have to be. Mm-hmm. I, might, I might have to retire monkey business. <laughs> nice. <laughs> So yeah, Total Recall. It's my number one. If if you if you haven't seen it, you know you're. What have you been yeah, doing for the last thirty years? The fuck? <laughs> Probably <laughs> Anthony hasn't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Shout out to the watch. Uh oh. Right. Number one, Langan. My number one. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out to to a couple of the movies I know didn't make the list. Visioneers with uh, Zach Galifianakis. It was on Netflix for a while. Guy in the, you know, a shitty office job all white they do this boring job it's kind of like brazil but he wants to break out of that and stuff it was streaming on netflix i don't know if it still is um visioneers that's one of them and um my number one is uh mad max 2 road warrior road warrior uh i think that's like the benchmark of post-apocalyptic films the first one's great obviously but the second one i think is just it's almost like the Evil Dead to me. Evil Dead one is great. Another but, another eighty seven Evil Dead. Too. But has now they got a little bit more of a budget because the first one was a cult classic and they you know retell basically the same kind of story. But there's a lot more action and characters in it and development. The fight over gasoline it works again as action and sci fi. Uh, it's a perfect movie, and I could watch it over and over again. Uh, so. Yeah, The Road Warrior. Very good. Awesome. Yeah. So there goes top five dystopian movies ever. You've, uh, I guess it was the first time we've done something like this. So Yeah. And it's a cool angle. So Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad. I like pushing things forward. Like with the show, 
um, whether it be like the the stuff that we're doing with the tournament stuff or like I just like you know I don't want to get stale I want to just like do shit keep it fresh keep it fresh do yeah. certain things um, like I said keep an eye out for the playlist that are going to be coming out so if, if you, you find have it you can yeah follow it right you can subscribe well, yeah, to it it's it, public now right so it's public and it's just like under my band name so it's like playing dead and then there's an ny after it yeah. so i think um, you can subscribe or you can follow it and then that way when you, you make new ones yeah it, it should or if they follow playing dead yeah i guess it'll so. update them when new ones are up but yeah, we'll know. also tell you on facebook and, and so. whatnot so. but real quick before we end so uh we asked for 1987 um, what was a better record, Girls, Girls, Girls by Motley Crue or Appetite for Destruction by Guns N' Roses and Parker? It was Parker. close. <laughs> so close. Well, what would you pick? I picked Appetite. You did? Yeah. Okay. Scott? Without a doubt. Just does, It's not close, right? It's not even close. And, and it's Appetite was the record that the punk kids could listen to, and Guns N' Roses was the... The hair metal yeah. band that it was cool it was okay for us to listen yeah. to. Early Metallica, that Motorhead, Motorhead. Yep. kind of. Those were all. Those were all. Everything was like. Yeah. <laughs> okay. He's like, all right. That's and happening. and you pick Girls Cross Girls. Obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you're talking about one of the greatest albums ever made by anybody in and music history, versus one of it, maybe Motley Crue's worst album <laughs> they ever made. And they made a lot of bad ones. I don't, they followed that up with "Girl, Don't Go Away Mad." Yeah, that was yeah. And the Doctor was that Feel that? Good. That was Doctor Feel Good. Girls, girls, girls had uh, girls, girls, Wild girls Side, and Wild right? Side, yeah. Which is Wild Side's a great song. Girls, girls, girls. I mean, <laughs> it's fucking juvenile as shit. And I picked really two random up. records. What do you want from me? <laughs> but and and Nona, that song. <laughs> yeah. That's the definition of. Uh, a filler track. If you looked it up in Webster's, <laughs> I believe you'll find Nona in their by defense. Nick Sixty, but you wrote about his aunt who passed away. I shouldn't be so cold blooded, but <laughs> they admit they admitted that record was so cocaine fueled that they had no idea what they were doing. They said it sucks almost. So it works for Stephen King. It doesn't work for Monica. It can't work for everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Like so. Jeff Warsaw said, they didn't have the right balance of cocaine. Of co- yeah. Like shout at the devil, they did. Jeff is fucking awesome. <laughs> Jeff Jeff's podcast was one of the ones that influenced me to like actually try this podcast thing out. Yeah. So, and then lastly, we asked, um, uh, what was a better movie from 1987, The Lost Boys or Hellraiser? What did you pick? Parker? I did Lost Boys. You did? Yeah. Okay. Lost Boys. Lost Boys. Lost Boys. I went Hellraiser. Ooh. I did. Right. You know, because for me, I think Near Dark was better than Little Lost Boys. Mm. Um, I I could go back and listen. I mean, I'm not gonna hell raise. You're not wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's just they're both great. But yeah, go yeah. ahead. So. Well, yeah, I I just uh, overall like when I, when I think of the movies that I, like if if I had a choice to watch one of the two, I would always go. Like like if I was on an island and mm-hmm. I could only pick one, mm-hmm. it would be Hellraiser. So. Yeah, but I mean, uh, the originality of that film, the world that it created was pretty amazing, yeah. and a yeah. lot of the the visuals. But at sometimes it plotting. Yeah, no, I get it. And yeah. Lost Boys is just like so much fun. Yeah. Like the characters, like it's an yeah. overall just great movie, and I get it. But I'm just thinking of like a desert island, you know, which what I want to, you know, I do I want to be depressed or do I want to be happy? So just obviously. <laughs> All right. All right. When well, you look at it that <laughs> way. So so I threw up two new ones. And and we're gonna uh, I guess talk about it uh, sometime tomorrow. And it was uh, U2's Joshua Tree versus The Cure's Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss That's Me. That's not even a, not. Even what would you? Are we voting? I would do U2. U2. Yeah. Not even close. The Cure. The Cure. All the way. Not The Cure. A hundred percent. Yeah. I gotta I hate go with the you cure. Too. Re- record, record, record world. Record world. Anyway. Yeah. That was like the, like the only thing you, me, and Ted we like always been. All right. Yeah. Right. Cure and on. The, and the cool single soundtrack. Oh, the so yes. oddly enough, and I hate the whole grunge thing. Yeah. And you guys weren't super into me either. Trust. But that yeah. would could that could be the record at Screaming Trees. Like, yeah, because almost we all got along except for what that would be the discussion of what got played in the record store. And stuff. So you had to find that common ground, you know what I mean? Of course. So. Um, and lastly, the, the you know, we're, like I said, we're doing the tournament stuff, and then the movie. The last thing we, that we did was, um, what did I say? <laughs> oh, over the top versus <laughs> spaceballs. 
<laughs> oh man. Woo. 1987. Nah, nah. And the space. Oscar goes yeah, to Spaceballs. I got to go Spaceballs. I love Over the Top, though, but I got to go Spaceballs. Okay. You have oddly named two films that my wife loves. Yeah. Um, Get her on the phone. says that. All right. <laughs> but Spaceballs, just there's an obsession with Spaceballs in my household. Park. I'm going to go Over the Top. <laughs> You're going to go? Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, I, I fucking hate Spaceballs. Wow. Why do you hate that? I don't really hate it, but I don't get it how beloved does, does it is. Does it make you hate the movie more knowing that people love it? Like for me, like I, I would Sometimes nev- I like doing that. I would never <laughs> No, but I would never think of a band like No Effects. But the fact that people that I respect love that band and I've tried for twenty five years to like them and mm-hmm. I think they're terrible. Right. It, it it just they're so visible in my in my eye that it's just like, you know what? I think they suck. So, like, is it is it because people love Spaceballs so much that you just don't get it? I don't get. Like, you don't okay, think the okay, black guy the with deal. the with the comb? Oh my god, so good! <laughs> like, I, I'm all a fan of juvenile humor. I like when the Zucker Brothers do it. Mel Brooks to me, not a huge fan. Is just like vaudeville to me. It's like Henny Youngman jokes. <laughs> But it's those just are like awesome. That's what makes it so I amazing. Mean, young man Take joke. my it's, wife, please. It's like <laughs> shit my dad remembers and he can tell at the bar at the <laughs> Yeah. At, you know Throw like, somewhere you've never been. Try the kitchen. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Take my wife, please. Yeah. So like, hey, yuck, yuck, yuck. But you know, hey, if you love it, God bless you. It's just I'm not a Mel Brooks fan at all, really. <sighs> okay, for me out of the two, <laughs> I'm going to go. Obviously, Spaceballs over the top, so terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking movie about arm Yo. wrestling. Oh, I love it. Yo, he won custody of his child yeah. for arm wrestling. <laughs> when you ever seen that shit before? It did make You've me... seen sci fi Star Wars looking <laughs> movies before, but. We did, like, me and my cousins would always arm wrestle because of that movie, and everyone would always try to do that. See, move. it brought you guys together. It did. <laughs> I mean, I haven't spoken to them in like. <laughs> 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 in 1987, we were tight. <laughs> so, but right, I also cool. kind of want to be that guy that didn't like baseball, so you can come at me nice. on the internet. Come at me, bro. Come at me in our Facebook group. <laughs> so, uh, okay, we're good. Next episode uh, will be with Neil Rubenstein from um, was it Sons of Abraham. Yeah, many of bands. Many of Lightfoot. Um, and now he does comedy. Which yep. is so he just hits the road and he does his, his stand up one man comedy act. Yeah, yep. so we're gonna talk to him and uh, that's it. Anything else? Just want to thank Scott for coming. I you drove down just for this apparently, right? Just to make this. No, podcast. I, I mean I drove down to hang out with <laughs> Damn. Him. Going, to, going to a Mets game tomorrow. So shout out to Dan oh, okay. Turner. Oh, Dan, yes. it's got to be mentioned. Oh, that's right. Yeah. How you like the Mets this year? Scott, not, it's, it's not a good subject. Oh, wait, Dan Taylor wanted to know. Well, we have one question from the listener, right, about the Mets. Uh, oh, I already asked him. Oh, about, the, like, I don't know, something about the, before tra- the trade. Oh, tra- all, I can, all I can say is trade everyone. Okay, yes. all right, all right. Now, would you go Mackie Sasser or Ron Hassey? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much for having me. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I think I could catch uh, the Iron Maiden encore. So I'll be right back. Yeah, thank you for coming down, man. Yeah. This was great. Absolutely. Absolutely.